Well, welcome everyone to our annual Parkinson's Disease Patient and Family Symposium. My name is Erin Checky, and I am a clinical social worker as well as the program coordinator at Northwestern's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center in downtown Chicago, and will be uh, moderating today's webinar. So today in partnership with the Parkinson's Foundation, with additional sponsorship from AbbVie, Kiowa Kirin, Supernus, and Synovian, we are pleased to present our annual symposium, which has been virtual for the past three years. A little housekeeping before we get started to ensure the webinar goes as smoothly as possible. After we hear from all of the speakers today, we will take questions from our web audience during the live Q&A. Questions can be submitted throughout today's webinar using the Q&A icon in the black banner on the bottom of your viewing page. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible. All, muting, uh, or all meeting attendees will be muted during the program. Uh, please note that the speaker volume of all our presentations are enhanced as much as possible on our end. So if you're hearing, um, if you have difficulty hearing any of the speakers, please ensure that your volume control is uh, as heightened as possible. Additionally, we have turned on closed captioning Keep in mind that this is not perfect and there will be errors, especially when it comes to medication names, um, but we hope that this option will help make our program a little more accessible. If you're joining using a phone or tablet, you should already be seeing the captions as I speak. If you're on a computer, however, um, please hover towards the bottom of your screen and click live transcript or CC, and then you can click on show subtitle. Um, and of course, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please message us using the Q&A icon. Um, we're going to be recording today's virtual symposium. So this recording, along with the slide decks of the presenters and resources discussed, will be sent in an email to attendees within the next couple of weeks. At the end of our program, we will have an evaluation pop up on your screen. So please uh, fill this out and let us know how we did and what you'd like to see in the future and how we can continue to improve these webinars. I will now introduce Dr. Danny Bega, who will uh, kick off today's webinar. Um, Dr. Bega is an Associate Professor of Neurology and the Director of the Neurology Residency Program at Northwestern. He has expertise in the care and management of patients with a variety of movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease and is the director of Northwestern's Huntington's Disease and Wilson's Disease Clinics. His primary area of interest is the study of alternative and non-pharmacologic interventions in movement disorders and their impact on quality of life, and he has received several grants to carry out this research. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you for everything you've done to put today's event together. Um, I, my pleasure really to welcome everyone today to this Northwestern Parkinson's Disease Patient and Family Symposium. Um, I am the lucky one who gets to present on behalf of our huge team um, that I'll introduce in a moment. Um, and I, I just wanna thank you all for taking time out of your day to, uh, to learn about Parkinson's disease. Um, we have an outstanding registration for this event of over 800 people um, who are tuning in um, or who will listen to this on the recording. Um, and it just speaks to the importance of this condition in the community and um, the importance of, of educational events uh, in general in empowering people uh, to deal with this disease. So again, thank you for, your, for taking the time. Um, you know, I, I think that today's event is going to be really exciting and a lot of our patients without knowing it have really curated the topics for today's event. Um, a lot of what we're focusing on today comes out of questions that we get all the time. We're going to be talking about nutrition uh, and supplements, and uh, those questions come up, you know, what should I be eating? What should I be taking? Uh, we're going to be talking about mood symptoms. Uh, we're often asked, you know, how do I know if someone is depressed or anxious, or should I be on a medication for that? Um, and you're going to hear about research. And, and I know that that's something that everyone is passionate about hearing about what, what, what's happening in the field. Um, where are we in terms of something that will slow down this disease or, or cure this disease one day? So today is really about empowerment. It's about empowering you through knowledge about the disease, 
you as a person living with Parkinson's, you as a family member, a loved one of someone with Parkinson's, um, to really be empowered uh, to, to, uh, through knowledge. Um, and to learn what you can do to impact your disease practically today. Um, and that's where we're going to talk about some specific uh, things that really focus on a holistic approach to care, whether it's, 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 it's lifestyle modifications through nutrition uh, or, or mind-body interventions that can improve your mood. Um, uh, I think it's, it's really important to understand this as a holistic disease um, and to address it that way. And lastly, I hope we'll leave you with some hope today. And why should you be hopeful when uh, you're not going to learn about a cure for the disease today, unfortunately? But it's really important to think about hope with this disease, first of all, because this disease is going to impact so many people. Um, it already impacts nearly a million people. By the end of this decade, we expect uh, nearly one and a half million people to be affected by Parkinson's disease. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there is a lot that we can do and a lot that we've, we've developed and been able to do just in the last several years in terms of improving quality of life and improving symptoms in dealing with advanced disease management. And, and really uh, with the trials, you're gonna see that we've had some, some setbacks and some failures, but there's a lot of excitement about new approaches and new focuses uh, for future therapies. Um, next slide. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit about our center. So our Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center, this is our mission. It's to provide a comprehensive multidisciplinary care to patients with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders while working on research into causes and treatments. And we promote health education and support for patients, care partners, family members, and healthcare providers and the community. And that's what we're here to do today is to provide that education. Um, and so the point here about comprehensive multidisciplinary care is important. Uh, next slide. Because Parkinson's disease is not just about having a tremor or an abnormality in, in walking, but it's a disease that affects all different aspects of someone's life. It, it, it does involve motor symptoms, but it also involves a whole array of symptoms that we can't so easily see that live beneath the surface that affect someone's life, uh, whether it affects sleep or mood or energy. Um, and, and, and this is a disease that needs to be uh, addressed at a, at a holistic level for that reason. Um, and so that takes a team of experts. And next slide. And so that's what we offer at Northwestern. And um, we have a comprehensive care model, uh, which includes neurologists and uh, surgical management, nurses, uh, rehab team, uh, where we collaborate with the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, um, exercise and fitness classes and physiologists, social services, opportunities for research through clinical trials and, and uh, an outstanding research team that we have. And, and it really takes a team of experts working together to manage the different aspects of the disease. Next slide. I'm really pleased to discuss that our program has not just grown downtown, but across the, across the state. Um, at our downtown campus, in addition to the typical management of Parkinson's disease that we've offered, we now offer a lot of subspecialty clinics within that, uh, including a palliative clinic, uh, a genetics clinic, a cognitive clinic within our, within our movement disorders program, a program focused on atypical Parkinsonism, uh, Hispanic movement disorders and Spanish speaking uh, uh, clinician clinic, surgical program, um, expanded research programs, and many new clinicians that I'll, I'll show you some faces of. In addition to that, we're also offering a lot of these outstanding services outside of our downtown campus, including our Lake Forest campus and our Central DuPage campus, and additional footprints in Palos and Glenview and Evanston as well. Next slide. And we're really excited about our ongoing collaboration with the Parkinson Foundation. And so today's event is, is co-sponsored uh, by the Parkinson Foundation. And we're, we're, we're working with the Parkinson Foundation on uh, where they support our events and, and we support their events, including Moving Day, which is uh, an important fundraising walk for Parkinson's that is uh, a week from tomorrow that you'll hear more about. Um, and, and we're proud to be a Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence. And that designation extends beyond just our downtown campus. And it includes our, our, our campus to the west at Central DuPage and to the north at Lake Forest. And this is really unique to have centers with such expertise that offer education and research 
um, and comprehensive care at multiple different sites. Next slide. Our downtown group has grown. You, uh, if, if you, if you uh, see us downtown, you probably have seen a lot of different names. And this is just showing, uh, I think about 13 different uh, movement disorder specialists. So neurologists who are all specializing and focusing on Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders in our downtown campus. Next slide. And beyond the neurologists, we have uh, uh, nurse practitioners and, and fellows and nurses, social workers, mental health counselors, rehab teams, uh, neuropsychologists and psychiatrists, genetic counselors, neurosurgeons, physiologists. Um, and and it, as I mentioned, it takes a team approach to address all the different aspects of the disease. And our newest team member, uh, we have a registered dietitian and nutritionist who's going to help us uh, counsel patients on uh, nutrition. And you're going to hear more about nutrition later today, as I mentioned. Next slide. Um, I encourage you to take advantage of all of our offerings outside of the clinic as well, um, especially in this era where we're, we're, we're offering a lot of things virtually, um, support groups for different areas of focus, whether it's young onset or care partners or general support for Parkinson's. We have a women's support group. We have an atypical Parkinsonism support group. We do educational events, including a PD 101 and 201 for general information about Parkinson's. And then we do uh, activities as well virtually, including yoga and exercise classes. We have a, uh, an improv uh, therapy program, which is really popular, which started out of a research study that we did and many more programs. So look out for this in our newsletter, join us virtually. Um, and, and while we'd love to see people in person and, and we'll continue to work on ways to find ways to, to bring you back together in person, um, we're finding that we're able to really reach a lot of people with a lot of these virtual programs, which is really uh, exciting. Next slide. And, and the people behind the scenes that you don't see, the, the people in the lab, the people doing the research that we collaborate with that, that lead to drugs developing that, that come to the clinic is another thing that we have a real strength in at Northwestern, we call that translational research when we combine the, the, the lab work with the clinical work and we work together. Next slide. And, and we're learning more that in Parkinson's disease, there's, there's an important uh, combination of genetics and environment and other factors that are unique to individuals that, that lead to the disease that need to be addressed. Um, and, and all of these different areas, um, whether it's genetic or, or other cellular risk factors, are areas of focus that our scientists are working on treatments for that, that we, uh, will, we hope to one day uh, find a way to slow down the disease by targeting these different mechanisms. Next slide. And our symptom treatments are growing. We've had uh, an explosion of new uh, pharmacological therapies and uh, interventions in the last decade, um, including surgical therapies and devices and new ways of delivering medications that have really changed the field. Next slide. We'll always remind you of the importance of the things you can do for yourself because it empowers you to, to, to stay healthy um, and they, these are interventions that really impact the way the disease affects you, whether it's, it's conventional exercise or mind-body activities. Um, staying active remains our best way of slowing down the disease and dealing with both the motor and the non-motor symptoms simultaneously. Next slide. And many of you uh, have been really great about even pioneering or participating in a lot of these activities um, and, and finding really exciting and unique ways to get involved in the community. Next slide. So just some summary comments here uh, before we head into our dive into our agenda. Be optimistic about the horizon and hopefully you'll get some of that sense from, from, from the research trials uh, that, that are going on. Get expert opinions at specialized Parkinson's disease centers. I'm aware that a lot of people listening today may not be patients of, of uh, uh, Parkinson Foundation Centers of Excellence. Really encourage you to get expert care at multidisciplinary centers for this condition. Inquire about clinical trials. Use our resources, whether it's our educational events, our support groups, our virtual events, and realize that we right now have really effective potent medications to treat symptoms, and those are evolving. It's really important to stay active. That's without doubt one of the most useful things that we can recommend to you today. Next slide. And so with that, we're gonna start our, our, our symposium off. I would like to thank our sponsors first. Again, the Parkinson Foundation, Kiwa Kirin, 
Abvi, Supernus, and Synovian who help us put these events together. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to Jessica Barsh from uh, the Parkinson Foundation. She's the community program manager for the Midwest uh, uh, chapter of Parkinson Foundation. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Dr. Beggar, for that introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Barch, and I'm the community program manager of the Midwest chapter. Um, I'm just going to share a few slides with you really quick here. So the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation is essentially to make the lives better of anyone affected by this disease. Whether you're living with Parkinson's, caring for someone with Parkinson's, or working to end this disease, um, we are really here to support you. And we really focus on three goals, and that is improving care for people living with PD through centers of excellence, just like Northwestern, um, advancing research toward a cure, and are empowering the community with our educational resources. And the foundation has a wide array of free resources. We have educational books, a podcast, our wear and care hospitalization kit, a helpline staffed by experts, our website, parkinson.org, and so much more. Um, as Dr. Bega mentioned, we have Moving Day Chicago coming up on Sunday, October 16th, and we invite you to move with us at Soldier Field. This event is an inspiring and empowering annual fundraiser that raises awareness about Parkinson's disease, as well as funds that benefit the PD community. Moving Day is more than just a walk. It is a celebration of movement, which has been proven to help manage Parkinson's symptoms. To register or learn more, head to www.movingdaychicago.org. I also want to share some really exciting information with the, um, and opportunities for the PD community. Did you know that the Parkinson's Foundation is offering genetic testing at no cost for people with a PD diagnosis? This initiative is called PD Generation, and participation can either be in person at one of our participating centers of excellence, such as Northwestern, or now from your own home through a telemedicine appointment and an at-home cheek swab kit. To learn more, visit www.parkinson.org slash PD Generation. I also want to highlight a study you can participate in from your home. The Topaz study will test if a medicine can prevent fractures in those older than 60 living with Parkinson's disease. If you qualify, a nurse will come to your home and you'll receive a one-time treatment. Call our helpline at 1-800-473-4636 to join or to learn more. And the foundation has started an initiative meant to capture the community's perspective on various topics in Parkinson's disease, like mental health, telehealth, and cannabis. By signing up for this initiative, we will email you up to four times a year requesting that you complete a 10 to 20 minute survey. Findings are always reported back to the community and you can join via the link on your screen. We have a great program coming up and we are bringing care partners together in person and online to provide tools and resources to help make life better for themselves and their loved ones with Parkinson's. Our Midwest Care Partner Summit will focus on how to manage evolving roles and identity, as well as thinking changes in Parkinson's. This is a hybrid program where you can attend in person in Brookfield, Wisconsin, or from your own home via Zoom, like today. And to learn more, visit www.parkinson.org slash Midwest CPS. And lastly, I want to inform you of our Zoom series, PD Health at Home. This weekly series is held on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays every week and focuses on mindfulness, wellness, and fitness. To learn more or to register, please visit parkinson.org slash PDL. Thank you everyone for your time and attention today, and I will turn it over to Erin. All right. So again, thank you, Dr. Vega and Jessica for the introduction and the information. Before we begin, uh, begin today's presentations, just want to remind people of today's agenda, three minutes behind. So I would consider we're doing well. So we'll start um, by hearing from Dr. Lori Mishley about natural therapies and nutritional requirements for Parkinson's, followed by a presentation by Dr. Simuni about more of the therapeutic pipeline in Parkinson's disease. We'll take a short break come back and hear from Dr. Bega and myself who will address the psychological aspects of Parkinson's disease and then finish with our live Q&A panel. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lori Mishley. 
Dr. Mishley is the principal investigator of the Modifiable Variables in Parkinsonism Study, which is attempting to describe why some people with Parkinson's disease progress slower than others. She founded the canine scent-based PD scre screening tool, PARC-K, developed a patient-reported outcome measure to assess PD severity, and is instructor of the online series Parkinson School. Dr. Mishley maintains a small clinical practice at Seattle Integrative Medicine focused on nutrition and neurological health. Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Mishley, and I'm here to talk to you today about something I am very passionate about, which is complementary, integrative, holistic, natural therapies for Parkinson's disease care and management. The first thing I want to do is thank the hosts for giving me a topic as broad as they did. Um, I'm often asked to speak about the relationship between diet and Parkinson's disease progression. And it is virtually impossible to talk about food without talking about the context of complementary and alternative medicine, supplements, and other natural therapies. You will see as this course goes on, this lecture goes on, that there are a hodgepodge of complementary and alternative therapies. I could spend this entire 30 minutes just talking about the research on forest bathing or mindfulness or exercise or photobiomodulation for Parkinson's disease. Um, we're not going to touch on all of those too much. My area of expertise is in the nutrition and the diet perspective. Are there things that people with Parkinson's need to do bet to above and beyond what a non-Parkinson's person might need? Are there things that if you did a little more of this or a little bit of that may lead to improved outcomes and higher quality of life over time? As I was uh, wrapping up my PhD dissertation, I will take a second to tell you that I had this moment where I realized I had just spent 14 years of my life and a couple hundred thousand dollars getting PhDs and MPHs and NDs and all of these degrees, um, which led me to this place where I concluded the better we sleep, the more we move, the more fresh fruits and vegetables we eat, the more friends we have, and the more financial stability we have, the better we do over time. So I'm not convinced that when you walk away from today's talk, I'm going to say anything terribly mind-blowing to any of you, but I do want to let you know that there really is an emerging body of evidence suggesting that there are some things you might be able to do today that might improve the quality of life and your Parkinson's symptoms over time. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. The figure on the left looks at what symptom reduction would look like. If we gave you a medicine that decreased your symptoms initially by 50% and you were able to maintain that benefit over the course of the rest of your life while the disease continues to progress, that's what that dotted line would show. If you look at this figure on the right, we don't see any symptomatic benefit. What we see is a decrease in the rate of pro pro progression. This is what a 50% reduction in rate would look like. And so what I really wanna show you here is, is how much this translates over time, not necessarily today, next week, or next month. So where the blue line becomes orange is where quality of life goes from good to fair. Let's call that our threshold. The goal is to keep everybody below 1,000 in the green and blue zones. I want all of my patients saying my quality of life is good or excellent. So if you do nothing, if you just plot along like a typical average patient with Parkinson's disease, our data suggests that the average person gets about 10 good years of quality of life with Parkinson's disease. If one is able to reduce their symptoms and maintain that benefit as the disease progresses, that translates to approximately 17 good years with Parkinson's. Alternatively, if we don't do anything to treat your symptoms, but we just slow the rate of progression by 50%, you might not notice it early on, but what that translates to is more than 20 good years, about 23 good quality of life years with Parkinson's disease. 
One more thing I want to point out before we move on is if you are talking about a symptomatic therapy, you take levodopa for your tremor, you immediately know whether it's working or not. Within the first month, you are clear it helps or it doesn't. When we look at the figure to the right, for those first couple years after making the change, it's not really clear whether it's working or not the benefit becomes more apparent over time. And this is both a problem for patients who are trying to get some feedback. I'm doing all this stuff. Is it helping? Is it working? And you don't know because you can't start and stop and feel different. You don't get the symptomatic benefit. You're really having to do this based on faith or, or good judgment or your view of the literature. The other thing I'll point out is this is what makes it so difficult for researchers to study disease modification. Our clinical trials only go out a year, maybe 18 months, and that is the window where it is most difficult to see an improvement if it exists. And so it is not feasible for us to do a double-blind placebo-controlled intervention trial that goes out 10 years. Uh, so we have to cut it short to save money and stuff like that. Um, but I also want to point out how difficult it is for researchers to be able to find disease-modifying therapies in those first couple of years. We now know that diagnosis of Parkinson's disease occurs really late. By the time you are told this looks like Parkinson's disease, most of you have had Parkinson's in the degenerative process that goes with it for at least 10 years. Many of you have been dealing with non-motor symptoms, loss of smell, bowel issues, anxiety, apathy, fatigue, depression, erectile dysfunction that have gone undiagnosed. And only when you get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease does it all kind of start to make sense. My research starts at the point of diagnosis forward. When I'm talking to you today about the research, what I want to make sure that you understand is my the thing I am most passionate about is not so much what led up to Parkinson's disease, but are there things that people with Parkinson's can do from the point of diagnosis that will shape the slope of that progression? The real true goal here is not just to slow Parkinson's disease progression, but to get to people who have Parkinson's disease before they develop motor symptoms. During the first 10, 20 years of this disease, if we can identify people with early Parkinsonism before the motor symptoms kick in and initiate some of those disease-modifying therapies, then we could truly be opening the door to prevention. That's what I am most excited about. So, Epidemiology is the study of populations, and most of the epidemiologic research that has been done in Parkinson's disease to date has been something called traditional epidemiology. What are the things that people are doing in midlife that increases or decreases their risk of being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? We have a dozen or so studies that say, you know, the more dairy, red meat, pork, fried food, processed foods, sweets, desserts, a person eats, the more pesticides they're exposed to, the more likely they are to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Similarly, the more fresh fruits and vegetables and exercise you do, the less likely you are to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's. That's great if the goal is to prevent people from being diagnosed, but you are here today because you've already been diagnosed and you want to know does anything I do change the outcomes over time? And that is called clinical epidemiology. And there has been very little research in clinical epidemiology in the field of Parkinson's disease. Very briefly, I said there are a handful of studies that say dairy increases risk of Parkinson's. The whole study I'm about to talk to you about really came about because so many of my patients were coming to me saying, well, does that mean I should stop eating dairy? And the honest answer is, there is no evidence or there was no evidence that once you already had Parkinson's, changing your diet would change the rate of progression. And so I started this study to, to answer those types of questions for my patients. Before we dive into the results, I wanna make sure that you understand that association does not mean causation. People who are eating more broccoli and cauliflower and fresh organic fruits and vegetables are probably also more likely to have gym memberships. You know, people who are exercising seven days a week are probably have less apathy. 
And so we are not at a stage where we can say A cause B. That is not what these research results show. Uh, an example here, pesticides. We know pesticides are associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. What we did in our study is we asked patients, true or false, I try to eat organically grown foods when possible. People who said true to that statement were less symptomatic than people who said false. Does that mean that organic foods will decrease symptom severity? Not necessarily. And, and I'll just say here, the statement was not, I always eat organic, right? Some people can't afford it. Sometimes it's not accessible. I very intentionally chose the wording. I try when possible. That's all we're asking you to do. Try when possible. I am not saying that every single thing you put in your mouth has to be organic. I'm saying when it's, you're in a position to avoid foods that have been sprayed with pesticides, you should probably try to do that. So what you all really want to know are, are there things that you can eat that slow Parkinson's rate of progression? One more thing I want to say about study design before I dive into this. Most of the research that has happened in the Parkinson's community to date is efficacy research. Um, we try to get the same type of people in the same age group so that they are as identical as possible. And the only thing that differs between the people in the study are the red pill or the blue pill. And at the end of the day, that allows us to make some very firm conclusions about the red pill versus the blue pill. This is an ideal study if we are trying to understand mechanism of action. Conversely, I am more interested in effectiveness research. And what I want to know is, are there therapies that are in a real world environment going to translate to clinically relevant improvements for the patients in the, in the general population? Those are pragmatic goals instead of explanative goals. A great example of this is Lyme's for scurvy. We had 3 million people died of scurvy before we started using limes to treat and cure scurvy. For 200 years, we treated scurvy with limes and then we discovered ascorbic acid, vitamin C. What I'm trying to do is bring you the limes. Somebody else can figure out ascor whether it's ascorbic acid or the molecule or what it is on the bad foods that's harmful or what it is in the good foods that's protective, that's not really my area of interest or my research focus. What I'm looking for are the real world things that real patients can do today that will lead to improved outcomes, whether or not I understand the mechanism of action behind it. So very briefly, uh, the research approach that I took is something called a positive deviance model. Um, those green dots on the figure are all real people with Parkinson's disease, and the blue line through the center represents the average rate of Parkinson's disease progression. Very simply, I'm using the diversity in this community to my statistical advantage. I am looking at the people doing unusually well and trying to figure out what are they doing, looking at the people doing unusually poorly, trying to figure out what they're doing, and I'm statistically comparing the two groups. The way I am rating Parkinson's disease severity is something called the PROPD. It's a freely available outcome measure that I built for the purposes of this study. And what we ask study participants to do is um, rate the severity of their 33 different symptoms on average over the last week. Um, in the middle, you can kind of see the longitudinal slope of Parkinson's disease progression. That's kind of the anticipated expected rate of change. We are still looking for study participants, uh, anybody who has 90 minutes twice a year to spare and has access to the internet. We would tremendously appreciate if you would consider joining this study. Um, and the last thing I want to say before I get into the real meat, pun intended, of this presentation is that I don't expect you to like what I'm about to say. You may not like the taste of the medicine. Whether or not this is acceptable to you, appealing to you, seems doable to you, is very different than whether or not it works. 
I also want to say that psychologically, there's a whole bunch wrapped up behind food. We don't just eat to feel full. We eat when we're happy, when we're sad, as part of ceremony and culture and community. Um, a neurologist here in Seattle said to me once, my patients have lost so much, I'm not going to take away their cheeseburgers and milkshakes too. I think that's very disempowering. I don't think it's their decision. I think the physician's job is to give the patient the data, the information, and let the patient decide what they are up for. I was with a psychiatrist in Parkinson's disease specialist last week who said to me that they were recently referred a patient for anxiety. And when they sat the patient down, they learned the only thing this patient was anxious about were all these food restrictions their movement disorder doc had given them. So, you know, I've had patients say to me, I would rather spend the rest of my life in this wheelchair than give up ice cream. I've had other patients say, hey, listen, no problem. If there's a chance this could help and this can hurt, just say the word, I'm done. That's what I'll eat from now on. Some people go kicking and screaming. Some people do, are a little more analytical, what makes sense, what doesn't. Some people are creatures of habit. Some people just don't have the community support to make some of the changes. That's all okay. And this is all part of management, managing Parkinson's disease and lifestyle modification. Malnutrition is tremendously common in Parkinson's disease. And we don't work it up. We don't have people who specialize in Parkinson's disease malnutrition. It kind of falls through the cracks. Dietitians aren't terribly well informed about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's doctors aren't terribly well informed about malnutrition. Um, but what we see is that people with Parkinson's who are malnourished are more likely to have anxiety, depression, constipation, cognitive impairment, and dystonia. From, this is the natural therapies uh, heading. There is nothing more potent in terms of things associated with better outcomes over time than exercise and friendships. People who are exercising 30 minutes a day, seven days a week, are doing better than people who do 30 minutes of exercise six days a week. Six is better than five, five is better than four, and the first two days seem to not make much of a difference at all. People who say, true, I have a lot of friends, are statistically doing better than people who said false. And conversely, people who say, I have a lot of stress and I am lonely, are doing having more Parkinson's symptoms over time than people who are not stressed and are not lonely. What we don't know is whether or not that can become a therapy. Can we take a person with Parkinson's disease who may not be doing very well and teach them stress management techniques, help them figure out ways to minimize the stress in their life and get them some friends? Can that translate to something therapeutic? I don't know. That's the research that's called an intervention trial, and that's what needs to come next. And there are some simple activities that might feed two of those goals in the same swoop, right? Exercise with friends. Now you have friends and exercise. It took the same amount of time, but you checked two things off the list. I'm trying to make it so that it is easy and fun for you to adopt healthy lifestyle. Okay. So what many of you want to hear, are there foods associated with better outcomes over time? According to our first published data in 2017, the answer is yes. Fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, nuts and seeds, non-fried fish, olive oil, coconut oil, wine, fresh herbs and spices were all associated with better outcomes over time. Conversely, the more canned stuff people ate, canned fruits, canned vegetables, fried foods, beef, ice cream, yogurt, and cheese were all associated with worse, statistically worse Parkinson's outcomes over time. All of these results were adjusted for age, gender, income, and years since diagnosis. We have done that same type of analysis, but with an updated data set. Now we have 2,900 people in the data set, and what we did is we looked at everybody through 2021 who had joined the study. For this figure, I have left the bad stuff off. I want you to not worry so much about the quote unquote bad foods that I want you to avoid. I see too many people avoiding the bad foods, but still not getting enough of the good ones. What I would like to do is have you leave here today determined to prioritize 
more good. Rather than take things away from you, rather than be restrictive, I would like you to focus on, can I find a way to get a few more fresh vegetables into my diet? Brown rice, fresh fruit, coconut oil, olive oil, nuts and seeds, eggs, fresh herbs and spices, oats, wine, non-fried fish, and green tea were the foods that the people who are doing the best say that they are eating the most of. It's not just about what you eat, but how you eat. We see that people who are doing the best tend to say true to the following statements. I avoid soda. I regularly eat buckwheat. I avoid dairy. I regularly eat farro. I avoid artificial color or sweeteners. I avoid beef. I only consume gluten-free bread and bread products. I avoid artificial colors and flavors. I routinely prepare meals for others. I try to eat organically grown foods when possible. I am a vegetarian. I regularly eat quinoa. I avoid pork and I use spices liberally. I do not believe that every one of you needs to say true to all of those things. I don't think that every single person with Parkinson's needs to give up all gluten containing foods. I just want to let you know that the people who are doing best were more likely to say true to these statements. Do I think buckwheat is the cure for Parkinson's disease? Absolutely not. Do I think that ancient grains like buckwheat and farro and quinoa might contain certain fibers that help feed good healthy probiotics in our gut that subsequently decrease intestinal inflammation and improve overall health? Maybe. Again, that's the difference between the pragmatic and the explanative. What we don't know is how this translates over time. Most of the people in our study, that solid blue line is the data that we are pretty confident about. We can say with 95% confidence that this is the mean rate of Parkinson's progression in our cohort. Um, what we don't know is for those of you who are planning on living a lot more than 10 years, what happens in the long term? How, and, and what we really know is that it's not going to be all about diet. There are a whole bunch of things that come into play when we are talking about slowing or accelerating Parkinson's progression. What we're trying, what we need to do is once we identify the variables associated with the best outcomes over time, what we want to know is can we package those? Can we deliver them? Can we teach people with Parkinson's to do the stuff in the blue circle and will that translate to a reduction in slope over time. My personal goal, my personal hope is that we can figure out how to slow the slope of progression enough that a 50 year old diagnosed with Parkinson's disease can live 50 more years with Parkinson's disease and still each step of the way call their quality of life good or excellent. That's my goal for all of my patients and my public health aspirations. There are, before we talk about supplements, um, there are a couple nutrition-based strategies for making Parkinson's disease more effective that I just want to touch on because they're so important. Uh, the first one is protein redistribution diets. If you are on levodopa and it is your experience that your morning pills work better than your evening pills or that sometimes your meds work and sometimes they don't, one of the most common reasons for that is because dietary protein is getting in the way of your medication working well. A uh, trick for that is not to limit the amount of protein that you eat but to save your protein for dinner. If you have a low protein breakfast and a low protein lunch, so levodopa and dietary protein use the same receptors inside your intestinal tract. So if you can save dietary protein for dinner, what that does is it kind of clears the way for your meds to have first dibs throughout the day, making your medication more effective. Um, there is a little bit of research that suggests that some people with Parkinson's, uh, especially elderly folks, may not make enough stomach acid to kick these meds in and activate them. On a in a timely matter. Uh, one study was done using a powdered vitamin C. Another study was done using a lemon's worth of lemon juice, and both of them showed that for a subset of people with Parkinson's, the addition taking your levodopa with a weak acid like vitamin C or lemon juice actually 
enhances the amount of levodopa available to your body. Another trick that is not used nearly enough is there is a dietary supplement. It's over the counter here in the United States. It's a prescription drug in other places. But here in the US, it's a fairly inexpensive over-the-counter supplement called CDP choline or citicoline. And there are a good, let's say, six studies now that have shown that if a patient with Parkinson's on levodopa adds CDP choline, that that can make the current dose of levodopa 30 to 50 percent more effective. The drug is stronger and lasts longer. Think of it as sort of like a natural intacopone sort of thing. So it tends to be safe. It's not very expensive. Um, this, more than the other supplements, should be considered a symptomatic therapy. Uh, this is one that I actually would like you to get the okay from your healthcare provider before you start because it actually works so well that most patients a month after starting it need to adjust their medication. So if you are going to start this, please get the approval of your doc. And in an ideal world, you would start it one month after before your next visit with your neurologist so that if your meds do need adjusting, they can help you with that at your next visit. So supplements. I don't need to tell any of you how sup uh, popular supplements are. This is predicted to be a $40 billion industry by 2026. And just within our own community, about up as many as 58% of people with Parkinson's are already using some dietary supplements. Most of your doctors are not providing much counseling on this, and a lot of you are doing it based on information that you get off the internet and from friends. So what we did is in our survey, we are only looking at people who responded to the survey in 2021. There were 1,089 people who responded to our survey. And this is a list of supplements that were associated with better outcomes over time. There were a long list of supplements that were not associated with improved outcomes. That will all be discussed in the manuscript. Um, but right now, uh, I just wanna show you the list of 13 supplements that were associated with the best outcomes over time. I cannot say this any more clearly. I am not suggesting that all of you go home and start all these things. Some of them are expensive. Some of them come with risks. Some of them have contraindications. If you have had breast cancer or prostate cancer and you start DHEA, you could be hurting yourself. Um, some of these are only for people probably who are low. And if you haven't had a test, you don't know if you need it. So I'm going to talk to you about each of these supplements, but I, I really want to say this is not a to-do list. This is just to get your wheels turning to let you know that for 200 years, we have not been able to come up with a pharmaceutical drug able to slow Parkinson's disease progression. And we just surveyed a thousand people and we have 13 that are coming up as associated with slowing Parkinson's, slower Parkinson's progression over time. Like I said, I don't know that the slowed progression has anything to do with these supplements. It could be that people who are taking ginkgo are also more likely to have gym memberships and be working with a movement disorder specialist instead of a primary care provider for their Parkinson's. There are a lot of things that supplement takers may be doing above and beyond the supplements. We can't say that the supplements are responsible for the improved outcomes. but. If you met me in an elevator and said, oh, I have Parkinson's disease, are there any supplements I should consider? This is the list. These are the supplements that were statistically significantly associated with fewer symptoms over time. Ginkgo, NAD, biologically active form of folate, oral glutathione, macuna, coenzyme Q10, curcumin, low-dose lithium, homocysteine lowering B vitamins, DHEA, coconut oil, vitamin C, and fish oil. Again, just because it was on that list doesn't mean you should start taking it. What I am suggesting uh, is that these are the supplements that you and your doc might consider, that you and your naturopathic physician or your movement disorder spe specialist talk to. Um, and really, my hope is that somebody else will come behind me and design some intervention trials to see, can we give people these supplements, one or some combination of them, and actually slow Parkinson's progression. So to wrap this up, I just want to say, you know, we are 
looking so simply at the people doing best and the people doing worst. And what each of you are going to do, have to do is figure out one, where is the starting point? Are you 50 or are you 90? Are you doing better than average or are you doing worse than average? What kind of shape do you want to be in on your 100th birthday? I have patients who will tell me I want to be in the excellent zone until I'm 110. I have other patients who say, if I live till 60 and I have, and I'm a little bit better than average, that's good enough. All I'm trying to communicate to you today is that you have options. There are way more tools in the toolbox than I think most people appreciate. Just like you are aware of the 15 different pharmaceutical drugs available to people with Parkinson's disease, a couple different forms of brain surgery available to people with Parkinson's disease. I would like you to walk away from today's talk realizing that there are tools you haven't even begun to learn about or learn how to use or to mess around with. What I am encouraging you to do is just become a little bit more well-informed. Don't judge it. Just try to make yourself a little bit healthier today than you were yesterday. Probably every once a month or so, somebody will come into my office and say, listen, I'm back to have you tell me everything you said last year, but now I'm ready to hear it. That's fine. If the only thing that happens with today's talk is I've planted a seed and given you something to think about, great. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to answering questions. In a little bit. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Mishley. And now we will hear from Dac uh, Dr. Tanya Simoni. Dr. Simoni heads Northwestern's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center in Chicago, Illinois, which, as you heard earlier, is recognized by the Parkinson's Foundation as a center of excellence. She is a world-recognized expert in Parkinson's disease modification studies, has more than 100 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals and book chapters, and has lectured nationally and internationally on Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Good morning. My name is Dr. Tanya Simoni. I'm the head of the Division of Movement Disorders at Northwestern University of Chicago, and it is uh, my uh, tremendous uh, pleasure to speak at our annual uh, patient education uh, symposium. And specifically wanted to follow, uh, as always, very inspiring and very up-to-date presentation by Dr. Laura uh, Mishlan. Uh, I was asked to speak on the therapeutic pipeline uh, across the continuum of the disease, but as majority of you know my focus is development of therapeutics to ultimately slow progression of Parkinson's disease and that's what most of my talk will be dedicated to. These are my disclosures and I will uh, speak on a number of programs that I have consulting relationship uh, with. And what I will speak today on very briefly, review the new symptomatic therapies uh, that are currently available, specifically uh, the ones that were approved over the last year, and the pipeline that is closest to potential approval. Then we'll move on to the current state of treatment of early Parkinson's disease, again at a very high level. And as I have already indicated, focus on experimental therapy, therapies to slow progression of the disease. And we'll close with a discussion of uh, genetically targeted therapeutics and whether genetic testing is uh, ready to end the clinic uh, and clinical discussions with your uh, clinicians. As all of you know, Parkinson's is the second most common uh, neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's. It is estimated that about a million people are affected by Parkinson's in the United States alone and about 10 million people worldwide. And it is considered to be the most rapidly increasing in numbers uh, neurodegenerative disease largely to the aging of the population, though some other uh, factors are being uh, debated and uh, discussed. 
Parkinson's is fortunate to have quite a number of therapeutic uh, options for management of the symptoms of the disease, specifically focused on management of motor disability, both at the time of the new diagnosis as well as with the progression of the disease. And this is very simplified categorical uh, slide that summarizes quite a number of classes of therapeutic agents available for management of the symptoms of the disease. Again, I want to highlight that we're ahead of the other uh, fields and we do have effective uh, therapies. I cannot overstress the importance of non-pharmacological management. A lot of that already has been discussed today in the morning, but management of any person with Parkinson's disease has to start with the education of the person and their family, discussion of the role of the exercise, uh, referral to physical therapy very early on in the course of the disease, as is a practice at our uh, center, role of speech therapy, occupational uh, therapy, nutritional uh, services, and overall support services for the person and the family. With the progression of the disease, the young pharmacological therapy, we do have powerful surgical advanced therapeutic interventions that include the brain stimulation, focused ultrasound more recently, and intradiagonal uh, levodopa uh, infusion all for appropriate discussion when appropriate with your clinicians. This is the slide that frequently is being sh uh, shared in uh, talks that provides high level timeline of uh, the course of Parkinson's disease. And as logical to expect, and as majority of you aware, Parkinson's pathology starts years before someone comes into the clinic with even the earliest symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And we now have accumulated quite significant data to uh, identify those potential risk uh, signs of Parkinson's, what we frequently refer as prodromal uh, signs. Obviously, not everyone who has constipation, uh, loss of sense of smell, excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, depression will ultimately develop Parkinson's disease. But we now have the tools to look at compendium of those features. Specifically, there is another sleep uh, impairment entity that is called REM behavior disorder to start actually being able to predict predict where the person is on the slope and whether they ultimately will progress to develop Parkinson's disease. And very excitingly, we're for the first time ever are conceptualizing therapeutic interventions in people who do not have the disease to ultimately prevent them progressing to the disease. And again, point zero is when someone is being diagnosed uh, with the disease in the physician's office. And as I have said, we have quite a armamentarium of uh, medications to treat the motor symptoms of the uh, disease. And then with the progression of the disease, we start facing some of the challenges of people experiencing more medication refractory symptoms in the motor domain, like falling, freezing, and starting to develop the non-motor signs of the disease that over the last decade have been so much in the spotlight and appropriately and legitimately so because these frequently are responsible for most of the disease-related disability and for most of the disease-related quality of life impairment. So uh, what are we doing well? And I repeat myself again that we have quite an armamentarium of medications to effectively treat early motor symptoms of the disease. For people who develop drug-induced involuntary movements that are called dyskinesia, we have an we have medications to treat uh, those along with the surgical options. Treatment of medications wearing off, uneven response uh, to the medications. Again, we have our momentarium of therapeutic options. And in the non motor domain, we have a list of uh, therapeutics to treat problems with the blood pressure, specifically something that is called orthostatic hypertension, uh, reduction of the blood pressure when someone stands up that manifests itself with lightheadedness, dizziness, 
uh, change of mood certainly is treatable part of the disease, management of hallucinations for the people who develop uh, them. And on the right hand side of the slide is again high level categorical uh, list of other symptoms that we have uh, much more limited uh, of therapeutic options and where therapeutic development has to go into. And these are um, falling, balance impairment, freezing in the, not, in the motor domain. And in the non-motor domain, I've listed only a few that certainly are at the top of the list of the discussions with the people who come into the clinic. Cognitive impairment with the progression of the disease, sleep dysfunction, fatigue, and the list can be longer and longer. So, where do we stand with the therapeutic development, specifically with the drug development? This is the timeline diagram of the th drugs in development, courtesy of the Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation. And unequivocally, you see the exponential growth of the number of drugs that are going into development, both for treatment of the symptoms and specifically focused on slowing of the progression of the disease. Not all of them will be approved, not all of them will be effective, but obviously quality will, quantity will lead to a subset of the drugs, novel therapeutics that ultimately will become available for people with Parkinson's disease. And again, this pie chart zooms in into the novel therapeutics by uh, the indication. And it's, it still is a busy diagram. And expectedly, still a big chunk of that diagram is medications that are focused on treatment of the motor symptoms. But you can see that at least one third in the light blue are actually focused on slowing progression of the disease. And on the left, left-hand side of the pie chart are the different non-motor indications that are finally coming in the spotlight for the drug development. So let's zoom a little bit further. What are the new therapeutics on the horizon? Uh, there are a couple of therapeutic approaches to optimize, to improve the current delivery ways of carbidopa levodopa, the dopamine precursor, the mainstream of therapeutic approach to Parkinson's disease. And what hopefully will come to the market will be infusion therapies of carbidopa levodopa. I repeat it again, the dopamine replacement therapy, carbidopa levodopa, remains the best and most effective treatment for people with Parkinson's disease. In the past, there was a fear on behalf of the uh, patients to start the medication because, quote unquote, of the honeymoon period, that is a wrong interpretation. The medication is the best drug that we have, the most efficacious drug that we have. As any drug, it does have its own limitations and side effects. One of them is a short duration of the effect, especially in people who have more advanced stages of the disease. And that is the reason why over the last five to seven years, there was there is so much focus on deliver on developing the continuous delivery uh, systems. We already have one in place, which is delivering it through the intrajejunal uh, tube, what is called duopa, but it is quite a setup for the patients to carry. So there is development of uh, drug delivery systems through the under the skin subcutaneous infusion akin to the insulin uh, pumps and two companies are the fr uh, forefront and the therapeutics uh, he has publicly announced that they submitted the application to FDA the studies have been completed and another company neuroderm uh, that based on the report on the clinical trials that gov does uh, he has completed uh, the studies, but results have not been presented yet. So something to be anticipated, definitely not uh, the therapeutic uh, for the people with early newly diagnosed uh, people with the disease, but at more advanced uh, stages of the disease.
Apomorphin infusion, the same idea, but different class of agents. It is a uh, dopamine agonist, but with a unique profile of uh, dopamine agonist. This drug has been available on the market either in injectable form or more recently in the sublingual rescue therapy form. And now uh, has been available as infusion therapy in Europe for many, many years, but hopefully will be coming on the US uh, market as well. Other uh, therapeutics were still indication for the motor uh, symptoms. I am, to be honest with you, less excited about all uh, these because these are not particularly novel therapies, but some of you have read about them and they're asking the questions. So there has been uh, a presentation on combination drug, which consists of two approved drugs, but smaller doses, Primipexol, which is the agonist, and Resagilin combined in one pill with the idea that smaller doses of two drugs would provide efficacy comparable to a higher dose of individual drug and thus reduce the risk of the side effects, but with, with sufficient benefit. And the studies have shown sufficient benefit of this preparation. So uh, we'll be under the review by the FDA and we'll see if it will come to the market. A number of you are familiar with the extended release preparation of carbidopa levodopa, known as Riteri as a capsule. Uh, drug. The same company is developing their quote unquote second generation of right theory to be given less frequently. And again, will be on the FDA review and might come to the market in about a year or so. Uh, there has is drug under the development in the class of dopamine agonists, uh, tabapidone, which targets different receptors compared to the ones that are available on uh, the market. I, as I have said, my personal approach is that, um, especially uh, nowadays, levodopa is back to being the mainstream of the therapy. So in my uh, view, these drugs would really need to demonstrate uh, strong efficacy and good side effect profile to come into the mainstream of the therapeutics. Moving on to the non-motor symptoms, I repeated again that that is a major unmet need, and it is rewarding to see that there are new therapeutics in development I am highlighting specifically cognitive domain and highlighting two drugs that are in phase two development, uh, which is one phase before the definitive efficacy studies. But again, what is re rewarding is that pharmaceutical companies are putting it in the spotlight, are developing the drugs, and the more pa people participate in this, those studies, the faster we will have the answer whether those therapies are effective or not. And now we'll move to the focus of my uh, discussions, uh, options to slow disease uh, progression, ultimately, hopefully, to halt progression of the disease. And the high-end summary is we do not have a winner yet, but the field is extremely active. And I always, and for the last couple of years, want to highlight the uh, review paper that actually uniquely is uh, published by uh, people with Parkinson's disease who have a lot of scientific expertise, and they legitimately call it a list of hope. You can find it on Online. Actually, if you just Google list of uh, hope, Kevin McFarthing, who is the primary author, and at the bottom is I am two other pie charts, again, highlighting from their manuscript how active the field is and how many different mechanistic targets are uh, being approached, hopefully to lead to us finding that holy grail of slow disease modification, slowing progression of the disease. This is another way of demonstrating specifically in the domain of therapeutics, targeting uh, slowing progression of the disease, how many uh, and how uh, much more actively and rapidly the field is developing in the last five years. And even despite uh, the um, a pandemic. Uh, so again, a lot of hope, a lot of enthusiasm. Now let's get into some of the biology of the disease so that 
you will understand where the focus of the therapeutics. You've seen these slides before. I've presented them on the previous uh, talks, but this is Parkinson's Pathology 101. On the left-hand side is the slice of uh, the brain of a person with Parkinson's disease versus normal one, um, illustrating the point that people with Parkinson's start losing dopamine-producing cells in the substantia nigra, substantia nigra, black part, quote unquote, nigra stands for black, and that's the area of the midbrain uh, where dopamine cells reside, specifically the ones responsible for the motor coordination of our movements. Uh, the uh, scheme in the middle is the uh, more zoomed in view of the individual cells and dark brown are what is called Lewy bodies. Those are the um, findings at this microscopic level, at the single uh, cell level, uh, that contain the aggregation of the protein called synuclein. And the diagram on the right is biochemical structure of uh, synuclein. So all the lines of data demonstrate that it is accumulation of synuclein, aggregated synuclein, that drives the pathology of the disease. And um, multiple lines of evidence from the animal models, from the genetic models, that if you reduce that pathological accumulation of synuclein, that should translate into quote unquote better health of the cell and as the function uh, of that improvement of the symptoms or slowing of the progression. One of the very exciting developments over the last one or two years is that for the first time, we actually are able to reliably detect synuclein in patients. So we can say that someone is carrying synuclein pathological aggregation. Right now, you need the most reliable source of tissue to do that is spinal fluid analysis for what is called seed aggregation assay. But there are active programs looking at the same approach in skin, saliva, nasal swab. Obviously, if you don't need to do lumbar puncture, that is much more beneficial. But to highlight to people that that is essentially important for us, both for be, to be more more accurate with the diagnosis, but most importantly for stratification of people who would qualify for particular studies. So speaking of studies, another fairly complex diagram at the top is the visual illustration of the fact that in normal healthy brain, uh, synuclein plays a very important role, still fully to be elucidated. It participates in connectivity between uh, the cells in the healthy transmission of materials from cell to cell. So normal uh, soluble synuclein is good. It is when it's starts aggregating, clumping, when it starts uh, in impacting the functional ability of the cells. And the diagram at the bottom demonstrates where in that cascade of abnormal aggregation and propagation of, pro of uh, synuclein protein, therapeutics are being developed to reduce that pathological process. The therapies that are most advanced are targeting synuclein that already has left the cells with the idea that if you reduce the uh, propagation of synuclein pathology from cell to cell, that will translate into the clinical benefit. And this is not all inclusive list of the therapeutics targeting different nodules of synuclein aggregation and propagation. Uh, I will comment on two studies that were front-running studies of synuclein targeting monoclonal antibodies that have been completed. Results have been published in New England Journal, the same issue, August issue, side by side, two manuscripts. Unfortunately, both studies have read out negatively. You can see that these are busy diagrams, but there is no separation between the active treatment and placebo in either of the programs. On the left-hand side at the top, you can see that in the Roche program, there was a signal of separation on the subpart of uh, the motor specific scale at Parkinson, uh, whether that is uh, will be confirmed in the further studies actually based on these uh, data, Roche is 
he has launched another study targeting people still with early disease, but be, being treated with medications. And the study is still be, uh, recruiting uh, the participants. It's called part of a study, and we are one of the sites. So how to, look, how to uh, reflect on the negative results? Obviously, negative results of the studies are always disappointing. But to juxtapose it to the Alzheimer's uh, disease, some of you have seen that uh, in the week that I'm recording this uh, talk, Alzheimer's field announced the first positive results of the study testing amyloid antibodies in Alzheimer's disease with robust close to 30% reduction of progression of cognitive dysfunction. So tremendous success of the field. Again, different pathology, different drugs, but the same idea of reducing the propagation of abnormal protein. And to put it in perspective, this is a very busy uh, slide, but it demonstrates how many years and how many programs it took with negative results to ultimately get to this positive study. So definitely we should be trying. Now let's move on to another class of agents that over the last couple of years have come into the spotlight. Some of you have been asking the question, so let me reflect on that. Uh, there is a whole, there is a number of studies that out of all are testing diabetes drugs and Parkinson's disease. So the first question to ask, why diabetes drugs and what is the relationship? So actually, if you look at the epidemiological data, there are a number of studies demonstrating that there is association between diabetes and increased risk of Parkinson's disease. Still, we do not have clarity whether it is association or whether it is truly causality. However, there are a number of potential mechanisms, despite the fact that obviously diabetes is predominantly the disease of uh, pancreatic insufficiencies so or peripheral disease, but insulin resistance and insulin signaling pathways are implicated in Parkinson's disease. There are also vascular changes, inflammatory responses. So there is scientific reason uh, to test our diabetes drugs. And the class of drugs that specifically is being looked at is they belong to glucagon-like peptide one class. This is the mouthful GLP-1 uh, compounds. These drugs also have been of interest to the community because they've shown besides benefit for diabetes, they've shown a uh, benefit for weight uh, reduction. So again, this is the summary of the programs testing different GLP-1 agonists and Parkinson's disease. Some of them uh, will be reading out the results in the upcoming future. And I am not getting into the details of those studies. They're interesting, more data necessary. But I really want to caution the community because these drugs are available for diabetes. I would strongly advocate not to try to get these drugs off label until the moment we have clarity whether they truly have promise and efficacy in Parkinson's disease. Another area of tremendous interest and a lot of questions is what is referred to is body-brain connection. And there is a lot of very exciting, very stimulating data coming from the animal models that Parkinson's pathology could potentially actually start not in the brain, but in the gut. And then that gut dysbiotic flora and propagation of the pathology up the neuroaxis into the brain. Whether that truly happens, propagation from the gut into the brain remains to be debated and discussed, but there is no question about the fact that there is impairment of the gut health in people with Parkinson's disease. So there are a number of studies as summarized on this slide, testing different approaches actually uh, to uh, uh, impact gut inflammation, gut uh, genetic microflora, gut uh, microbiome uh, flora. So a lot of interest, no answers. A lot of patients ask, what should I do? Obviously, very simplistically, 
uh, good uh, nutritional diet. I started advising people to take uh, probiotics. However, there is no probiotic of choice. Uh, so they are not controlled substances. So natural food supply uh, stores have them. And excitedly, we have a nutritionist who will be joining our group part-time to advise the patient if they have gut-related issues related to Parkinson's disease. A lot of you ask the question, what about stem cells and when will they cure Parkinson's disease? And as you know, there have been a number of programs over the years in the 90s, fetal cell transplant uh, programs uh, have been tested and all of them failed. Now we have different ways of generating those cells uh, through uh, a fetal still derived stem cells induced pluripotent uh, cells and so on. These programs are going back into the clinical trials testing. They will be tested in people with more advanced Parkinson's uh, disease. Again, I advised again, uh, seeking stem cell, cell transplants from some non-scientific freestanding uh, enterprises, talk to your doctors. But the major question remains, will they be effective in slowing progression of Parkinson's or serve as another symptomatic therapy akin to deep brain stimulation? And again, this is a busy slide demonstrating you that the field is active, that stem cell therapeutics are re-entering the field, but we're still in very nascent phases. And now I will briefly go into the discussion of genetically targeting therapeutics. And the reason for that, because these are actually in the clinic, on the left-hand side is the slide of concept of targeting not people with every person with Parkinson's the same, but trying to identify what is the biological underpinning of their uh, disease and target specifically that. And on the right-hand side is the summary of genetically targeting therapeutics, specifically GBA carriers, LARC uh, carriers that actually are in the clinic. So again, the whole idea is to try to match the therapy to the biology that specifically uh, drives the disease in the particular person. And two genes at the bottom that I've already mentioned, GBA and LARC, are at the phase of actually therapeutic uh, development very quickly. These are LARC targeting therapeutics. We actually are participating in all of those studies. So if someone knows uh, that they gene carrier, please uh, talk to your doctors about that. This is a Another uh, slide summarizing the list of GPA targeting therapists. This is obviously beyond the scope of this conversation to give you details on any studies, but really to highlight that the field is uh, very active and exciting uh, to uh, uh, the scientific community and should be exciting to the patient community. So if we are developing therapeutics to target specific genetic variants, how do we find those people? So should we start testing uh, for uh, gene variants, for Parkinson's related uh, genetic uh, variants? And we scientific community believe that the time has come. And while in majority of cases, it's not gonna impact your management, but in some cases with some particular gene variants, Variants. It might impact therapeutic decision, it might impact counseling of the risk of progression and obviously implications for the family. So we are one of the fortunate centers that actually has the opportunity to offer Parkinson's focused genetic uh, testing through the Parkinson Foundation Global Initiative, PD Gene. There are other initiatives. Some people are seek direct to consumer testing, but beware that that is a very limited panel. And what is important is that we do have Parkinson's uh, genetic clinic run by our experts who can not only counsel you whether that's something of interest for you to be tested, but obviously more, most importantly to discuss with you the results and implications of uh, the tests. And I will close with the way I've started that ultimately we want to move into the era of disease prevention and that's why the cube highlighting pre 
pre-diagnosis stage, stage of the disease. And we actually are at the stage where we are preparing to start therapeutic studies in people at risk. But again, we need to identify them. And there are programs specifically looking for people with a loss of sense of smell, people who have dream enactment behavior, what is called REM behavior disorder, genetic at risk uh, individuals. So again, we need to identify thousands of people because obviously uh, the, those features can be present in a lot of people who will never, never develop the disease. But one of the initiatives that I want to highlight and ask you to spread the word is community testing uh, of sense of smell as potentially an indicator of potential uh, risk of the disease. And there is the QR code on the right hand side that all of you can scan into your phones and that will land, get you to the landing page that will give you more information. So if each of you listening to uh, this talk spreads the word out to 10, 15 people who do not have Parkinson's disease above the age of 60, we will already identify a significant number of people to participate in this very important study. And now I will close with what shall we tell people with newly diagnosed uh, Parkinson's disease? First and foremost, seek expert opinion, specialized Parkinson's centers. Parkinson Foundation has a lot of educational materials. Inquire about clinical trials, because if you do not participate, we will not develop better drugs. We have potent medications to treat the symptoms. Exercise, general well, uh, wellness are essentially important, having a positive outlook and all all these are the things that are absolutely essential, really uh, important for the well-being of people with the disease at any stage of the disease. And I really love this acronym, MEDS, but these MEDS stand for meditation, exercise, diet, sense of well-being. So living well is reality and very important. And with this, I will close. Thank you very much for listening. And this is our ever-growing team. Thank you very much. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I, again, just wanted to thank Dr. Simuni and uh, Dr. Mishley who presented. And um, again, take time to call out the generous sponsors for today's presentation, Parkinson's, Kiowa Kieran, Abby, Supernus, and Synovian. Um, if you recall our agenda, um, this is when we were supposed to be coming off of our short break. Um, so I will uh, make the decision that we're going to um, skip that official break right now um, just to uh, increase our time for other presentations as well as the Q&A. But again, please um, get up, stretch, use the facilities if you need to, as this uh, webinar will be recorded so you can always um, see it again. So again, with um, we're going to skip the, the break, which again was going to show you some clinical research trials and resources from the Parkinson's Foundation. So we will make sure to include that in our wrap up email. Um, and we will, um, again, um, transition to Dr. Bega and I's talk, which is, again, going to address uh, more of the psychological aspects of Parkinson's disease. As I introduced, you know, Dr. Bega is the Associate Professor of Neurology um, at Northwestern's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center, and I'm a clinical social worker um, and program manager at the center as well. So Dr. Baker is going to start off today's presentation, um, and then I will um, end it with talking about some practical strategies and interventions. Great. Thank you so much. So um, today we're going to talk about psychological aspects of Parkinson's disease, and, and consistent with the way we practice multidisciplinary, this is going to be a, a tag team uh, with me and Erin, uh, who's uh, one of our clinical social workers, um, uh, who you all, you've already met. Next slide. And these are my disclosures and next slide. So the objectives are we're going to set the stage for non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease because we're going to be focusing on depression and anxiety, uh, which are very common among the most common of the of the symptoms in Parkinson's disease. 
And I'm going to just give you a sense of why they happen, why non-motor issues are important and relevant. And then we're actually just going to get really practical about how we deal with depression and anxiety, how we assess it, how we practically manage it, both in terms of medications and non-medication options. Next slide. Next slide. So I, I've given you a sense of this in my uh, in my opening earlier of Parkinson's disease as a you know as a, a condition that affects more than just motor symptoms. Um, it's not just your tremor. It's not just your slowness or your walking problems. It affects the whole body and the whole person. And uh, to different degrees in different people, we'll see other issues besides the motor symptoms, which we call Parkinsonism. We also see different. Uh, aspects of these below the surface symptoms. We call these the non-motor symptoms that can uh, really impact quality of life very significantly as, as shown by the you know, larger piece of the iceberg here dedicated to, to these non-motor symptoms. And so, and why is this part of the same disease? Let's go to the next slide. So uh, there was a large study that showed the importance of focusing on these symptoms. Um, we call it's called the Sydney study, um, and they followed park, people with Parkinson's for 20 years, and they found that the most disabling long-term problems were related to the emergence of symptoms that didn't specifically get treated with levodopa, and that was things like depression and cognitive issues. So we know it's really important to talk about this and to deal with it and to treat it because it's the most impactful. Next slide. So we, we know Parkinson's is a degenerative disease and the loss of neurons in the dopamine production areas of the brain are what we always focus on because dopamine deficiency leads to a lot of these physical symptoms. And how do we manage those physical symptoms? We replenish the dopamine with levodopa typically or other medications to, to fill the dopamine tank back up to improve the symptoms. But dopamine is not the whole story. Um, and, and, and it's one part of the brain that is, is really importantly affected in Parkinson's, but, but Parkinson's does affect other parts of the brain as well. Next slide. What we actually uh, think is that prior to the areas of the brain that make dopamine being affected, other areas of the brain can be affected even earlier than that. And beyond that, other areas of the brain can become affected later than that. And so the state, the way we stage the, the changes in the brain in Parkinson's over time is shown here. And uh, in these little circles designated is, is areas of the brain that we think are affected at different phases. And early on, we actually think the smell centers of the brain and the areas of the brain that regulate sleep, those can be affected even before the areas of the brain that control movement. Later, the movement areas, the areas that produce dopamine are affected and over time, other areas of the brain also get affected. And this is based on where we can actually see the abnormalities when we look at the brain under a microscope and we can see the abnormalities in lots of different places and not just the dopamine areas of the brain. Next slide. So there are a few symptoms that we know can precede the physical symptoms of Parkinson's by even up to 20 years. And so people don't necessarily think about these as being connected to their Parkinson's because they've had them for so long. But we find this really frequently in people who later on have Parkinson's, losing sense of smell, having constipation, having abnormalities in acting out dreams in their sleep, depression. These are symptoms that can occur at any phase in Parkinson's disease, but often we even see them before the physical symptoms present. Next slide. And so lots of different chemical pathways are important beyond dopamine. And uh, this really sort of ugly looking cartoon on the left is showing you these pathways of the brain that are all sort of interconnected and, and connecting different parts of the brain. And they're all signaled by chemicals, dopamine being one of them. But you can see in different colors here are different systems. Some are important for mood and some are important for thinking and energy and alertness. And there are impacts in Parkinson's disease on all of these different pathways to different degrees in different people. And so dopamine is important for things like motivation and attention and mood, but also serotonin we know is really important for a lot of those mood symptoms. And norepinephrine is another chemical and they're, they're, they, they have effects on one another and they independently have abnormalities in Parkinson's disease that can affect mood. Next slide. So, so not different non-motor symptoms are, are quite common and we ask about these pretty regularly at our visits. 
Uh, but mood symptoms in particular, because that's what we're going to focus on. About a third of people with Parkinson's have troublesome anxiety. Uh, almost half have troublesome depression. Um, and then there are other non-motor symptoms that we don't have time to talk about today, um, including cognitive problems and fatigue, which is very common, uh, urinary or sexual dysfunction, sleep problems, and each of these can be a talk in themselves. Next slide. So we're gonna hone in on mood symptoms and specifically depression and anxiety. And we're gonna think about these uh, in terms of the disease biology, which I've just shown you, the different pathways and chemicals, the disease experience and how that can cause mood problems, how we react to and deal with the disease, um, medications and other medical problems that can also influence mood symptoms, and then other external factors, stress, environment, social issues that can also lead to mood problems. And, and each of these needs to be thought about in terms of what, what they're contributing to the mood symptoms and how we deal with the mood symptoms. Next slide. So there are different ways we assess people for depression and anxiety. Um, it can be very formal. There are scales sometimes that are used that actually check off specific symptoms. There's formal psychiatric criteria. Um, there are also, uh, oftentimes it's off just a clinical interview, a discussion with the person and maybe with one of their family members or care partners um, talking about concerns and symptoms um, and then thinking about other medical conditions that come up. Next slide. So I'm going to start with depression. And with regard to depression, um, just a very fundamental, basic definition of, of what depression is, is uh, a sense of, of depressed mood or low mood, sad mood, or loss of pleasure in activities or things um, that's present for a lot of the time and impacting function. And that's when we worry about it. Next slide. So depression can be there with or without anxiety. Um, so they can come together or separate. Um, and it's really underdiagnosed and underrecognized. So I said nearly 50% of people with Parkinson's will experience it. And we actually did a study with the Parkinson Foundation a few years back showing that of people even seen at centers of excellence, um, uh, uh, nearly a third had uh, Parkinson's with depression. Half of them were not being treated for it. And even once depression was recognized, uh, an additional nearly 10% were not started on treatment for it. Um, and so there was really a lack of, of, of assessing for it. And even when it was assessed, there was often a lack of treatment. Next slide. So depression in Parkinson's is tricky for a few reasons. Well, one, we know it's common. And so we know we have to think about it and look for it because chemically changes in the brain affect chemicals like serotonin and dopamine, but also pathways are affected that are important for depression. But a lot of symptoms of Parkinson's can mimic depression and not necessarily be depression. And so sometimes a person with Parkinson's flat out says, I am not depressed, but other people almost accuse, accuse them of being depressed because some of the symptoms can be confusing. On the other hand, some of the symptoms can coexist with depression and, and we don't wanna miss depression because we misattribute all of the symptoms to Parkinson's disease. So in Parkinson's, it's normal to have slow movements or reduced facial expression. And that can sometimes be confused for depression, but not necessarily associated with mood symptoms. Softer voice, slower thinking, lower energy. Sometimes that is directly from the Parkinson's and not from depression. Changes in sleep or appetite. So all of these are symptoms that you can see in people with depression, but in Parkinson's, you can also see it without depression. So it, it needs to be distinguished from depression from the Parkinson's symptoms themselves. Symptoms that may be more specific to depression that you should not see just in anybody with Parkinson's is loss of interest or pleasure in activities, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, suicidal thinking or hopelessness, difficulty with concentration or irritability or frequent sadness. That's not normal for Parkinson's disease without depression. And so when we see those, it, it makes us more alert to thinking about depression as a, as, a, as a concern. Next slide. So depression, as I mentioned, can be a premotor symptom. It can present even before the physical symptoms or it can occur at any point along the course. It really needs to be addressed and treated in some way because it's really linked to quality of life for the patient and the care partner. Um, and it can actually make the motor symptoms appear worse. So even if you're most concerned about your tremor or your walking, having uncontrolled depression can directly affect the severity of your tremor and your movements. And so it's important to treat it for that reason too. 
Um, and, and so depression can have strange manifestations and in, in, in not just be sadness. It can be things like irritability or other symptoms. So it's important to look for that. There's an interesting phenomenon with mood symptoms in Parkinson's called off-time depression or off-time anxiety, which we'll talk about as well. And, and this is important to distinguish. So when does someone experience the depression um, is, is, is as important as whether they experience it. So is this a feeling that someone has all the time? Does it seem random? And, but it's important to pay attention to whether these symptoms come on directly around the time that medication may be due, for instance. So off-time depression refers to when your carbidopa levodopa, your dopamine medications, when they're at their low point, either it's been a long time since your previous dose, um, or you're due for a dose, um, or you haven't, or you've missed a dose. Do you notice that the symptoms that you're attributing that you think are depression, do they happen specifically around those times? And then do they go away when your levodopa kicks in? That's important because those are uh, symptoms that might be addressed more with the dopamine medications that we normally use to treat the motor symptoms. It may mean needing to take the, the carbidopa levodopa more frequently or extending its effects to treat the depression rather than using antidepressants. This is something where pattern recognition is important. Keeping a diary or paying attention to patterns of when you experience certain symptoms in relation to your medications can really help the doctor to decide if an antidepressant is needed or if we just need to change your Parkinson's medication regimen to address this if it's mainly occurring during periods of off time. Next slide. So things that you can do. First, I mentioned the biology of the disease. This is to, to a large degree chemical problem. Serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, these are chemicals that are uh, affected by the deposition of the, of, of the uh, proteins of, of Parkinson's disease throughout the brain, affecting these networks, affecting these chemicals, and, and sometimes they just need to be replenished or adjusted um, chemically. Exercise and healthy lifestyle, we'll talk about that, uh, and Aaron will talk about that a little bit, um, is really important for taking control over your disease, for improving your motor symptoms and improving your quality of life and your, and your mind-body connection uh, really has a strong impact on your, on your well-being. Um, and then working with a neurologist and sometimes psychiatrist or neuropsychiatrist or neuropsychologist to address this as well. We want to also address the disease experience and the stressors. It is good to talk. You want to talk to your family, to talk to your doctor about what you're feeling or experiencing. And accept that some chemical changes in your brain are not your fault. You're not, you're not just doing a bad job of, of accepting your diagnosis, um, that you need help to deal with it, whether, again, chemically or through, through discussions with therapists or with family members and, and other support people. So mental health professionals and social workers play a really important role there. And you want to look at, at other things, too, outside of Parkinson's disease. Um, are there other medical issues, cardiovascular, blood pressure issues that make you feel low energy, diabetes or thyroid problems that are uncontrolled that can cause depression? And then again, paying attention to that period of off time and whether off time is the issue, whether your, your Parkinson's medication is just not lasting long enough and you're experiencing symptoms specifically in the downtimes. Next slide. So antidepressants, just practically what you should know. They can generally take about four to eight weeks to take effect. So these are not medications that you take as needed or just occasionally or try for a few days. Um, there's no one right medication for everyone. So factors in deciding why I, a person might be on one medication versus another may include their age, the other medications they take and potential interactions, uh, propensity for certain side effects like sexual side effects or sleep problems or dry mouth or cognitive problems. And depending on how much that's a problem for a particular person and how much of those we, we worry about with a particular medication may, decide, may help us decide on, on which drug to use. Also, if someone has other symptoms that we hope a drug could treat, if we think we could get two benefits out of one drug, for instance, if we think uh, a medicine for depression might also help someone who has insomnia, then we might get two benefits out of it we might choose a drug that we think could treat both problems. It's really important to pay attention to dopamine blocking medications. Some psychiatric medications block dopamine and we label these antipsychotics. And those should typically not be used in people with Parkinson's disease because they can often worsen the motor symptoms. And so anytime an antipsychotic is being thought about, it should really be discussed with your neurologist because oftentimes these should not be used in Parkinson's disease. And then also importantly is that we're using these to treat depression not apathy. And that's really hard for people to distinguish sometimes. Apathy is not 
the same as depression. Apathy is when someone is sort of not, can't be bothered to do something, not interested in doing something, not really concerned about it, but just doesn't have any desire to do routine activities or participate in support groups. Um, I think the best way to think of it is just, do you feel like you just can't be bothered? And, and if that's the case, antidepressants sometimes can make that worse. And so that's something we really want to think about. Is this really depression or is this just not wanting to participate, not wanting to be active? Um, and they're not always the same thing. So important to discuss that with your, with your doctor. Next slide. So specifically in terms of antidepressants, we can target different chemicals with them. And so serotonin is one that we often find is really important to, to uh, can, uh, the effects of serotonin are diminished and, and, and leading to depression. And so some examples of medications that raise those serotonin levels are, are SSRIs, so citalopram, escitalopram, paroxetine, fluoxetine, sertraline. These are the typical antidepressants you may have heard of before. Um, and, and they're very effective in people with Parkinson's disease who have depression, and they're generally very well tolerated. Um, they can have some side effects, sometimes sexual side effects or sleepiness, depending on the drug and the dose, but generally these are well tolerated medications in people with Parkinson's. There are ones that also affect another chemical called norepinephrine, so we call these SNRIs, they affect serotonin and norepinephrine. Examples are duloxetine and venlafaxine. And these can also be effective for people with depression and Parkinson's disease as well. Um, sometimes these are used when there are additional symptoms like pain or fatigue that we're trying to address with these. Uh, but also these are, again, are, are, are proven effective in people with Parkinson's disease. There's a class called tricyclic antidepressants. Examples of these are amitriptyline and nortriptyline. These we would use less often in people with Parkinson's. They are very effective for depression and anxiety in Parkinson's, but they do tend to have more side effects, particularly in elderly people. And then there's mirtazapine and bupropion, examples of some drugs that don't fall cleanly into one of these other categories. Um, these are often used as well. Mirtazapine in particular can help with sleep and appetite. While butrin we maybe use a little bit less, it does have a potential benefit of increasing energy, but sometimes it can worsen tremors, and so it may not be right for everybody. Next slide. So shifting gears to anxiety, although they are often interrelated, um, thinking about anxiety as sort of excessive worry most, most of the time, impacting quality of life, impacting function, that's what we think about when we think about anxiety. Next slide. So doesn't everybody worry? Well, maybe everybody worries about certain things, but it shouldn't be persisting for long periods. It shouldn't be interfering with your activities of daily living. Um, and it shouldn't be occurring generally about most things. But we find that about a third of people with Parkinson's, this is what happens. And around, oftentimes this is preceding the diagnosis or around the time of the diagnosis. And it can be really problematic for the person and their loved ones and care partners. Um, it can be associated sometimes with physical symptoms that we sometimes call panic. So racing heart, trouble breathing, tingling, um, and sometimes worse motor function or attention. Sort of when you're in a fight or flight response, it sometimes can cause cognitive problems. You may realize that you don't pay attention well because you're nervous. And so again, this is something where even if you don't specifically, are, aren't particularly worried about your non-motor uh, symptoms, it can affect your motor symptoms and it can affect your cognition. Um, it can be with or without the depression. Um, it can occur with or without social phobia. So some people with Parkinson's will have this sort of fear or, or desire to not be around other people and not wanna be in social situations and avoid things like that. And that can be a symptom of their anxiety. And once again, we have this phenomenon of off-time anxiety and off-time panic symptoms, off-time shortness of breath. These are symptoms to look out for is maybe not, maybe not occurring generally, but maybe you'll notice a pattern where it's specifically periods of anxiety around when you are kind of due for a dose of medication. And that's treated very differently, not with psychiatric medications, but with adjusting the Parkinson's medications to fix that wearing off period. So pay attention to those patterns. Next slide. So again, what can you do here? Address the biology. Again, chemical effects. Like certainly again, serotonin and norepinephrine, also dopamine and other chemicals like GABA are affected. Um, and so we can use medications that treat, that address these different chemicals. Once again, exercise and healthy lifestyle. It's a holistic approach to treatment. It, exercise and healthy lifestyle will help the disease progression. It'll help the motor symptoms. It'll also help the non-motor symptoms like mood, mood symptoms, both chemically and physically. Um, and then again, the, the treating team that can help with, with addressing these, the neurologist, the psychiatrist, and others. 
you want to address the disease experience and the stressors. And so again, talking to your family and doctor, sometimes, sometimes what I find is that people see benefit from creating plans or routines. So there's less unpredictability. Unpredictability to the day often leads to a lot of anxiety for people. Um, and taking on too many tasks can be a source of anxiety. If you're still working full time and taking care of family members and taking on a lot of responsibilities and dealing with your Parkinson's disease, a lot of times people feel like reducing some of that, cutting back on some of that can help a lot with the anxiety. And then working with mental health professionals and social workers, again, can help. Pay attention to the phenomenon of off-time anxiety, again, because it's treated differently. Next slide. So anti-anxiety medications. So actually the SSRIs that we've already talked about, the medications that, that improve the serotonin delivery, um, that can also be the primary way we treat anxiety. One, because those are safe medications for most people with Parkinson's and they tolerate them well, and they don't just treat depression, they also treat anxiety. And that's often the first way medication-wise that we might manage anxiety with or without the depression. There are a class of medications called benzodiazepines, and these are medications like Xanax and Ativan and Valium and Clonopin. And these can be fast acting for relief of anxiety, but they have a downside. And we often uh, try to, to limit or avoid using these medications. Um, they can have effects that in some ways are similar to alcohol and can become dangerous in, in elderly people, particularly. Um, they can have dangerous effects in overuse or in withdrawal. Uh, people can build a tolerance to them and they can lead to confusion and falls, particularly in elderly people. And so we try to limit these as much as possible. In people with hallucinations, they can often worsen hallucinations. So that's something to be careful about. Other medications we sometimes use, a medication called buspirone can help with in some people with anxiety. There are questions about whether cannabis can help or hurt anxiety. I certainly have some people who have described benefits in terms of relaxing effects of cannabis on anxiety. It's been described. Uh, but not well studied. Um, but there's also reports of people describing anxiety from cannabis use and feeling paranoid and nervous from it. And so that may be different depending on the strain and the type. And so this is something to kind of enter with caution, um, not knowing a lot about the, the specific studies uh, proving any uh, specific benefits. And then there's another medication, which actually is an antipsychotic called quetiapine or Seroquel, which off-label will sometimes be used for its relaxing effects. Um, it can have sleep-inducing effects and sometimes is used for anxiety. Next slide. So just some tinkle points before I hand it off to Aaron, who's going to talk about some of the non-motor, uh, some of the non-medication options for dealing with these symptoms. So non-motor issues do have an important major impact on quality of life. In Parkinson's disease, depression is seen in about half of people, anxiety in about a third of people, and so it's really common. Don't be afraid to tell your doctor about it or your family about it. It's really underreported and we need to discuss it and address it. Um, it's important to distinguish um, the, the mood disorders from Parkinson's symptoms themselves. Not everybody who's slow or not having good facial expressions is depressed, but we need to screen for it. It's also important to pay attention to that off time. It, it, are these symptoms specifically limited to wearing off periods in terms of their timing with regard to your medication? And then treatments include addressing the biology, the chemical effects that you can't really control without medications. But then also the experience, talking to people, the medical issues around your other, your other condition and stressors and environmental things like maybe cutting back on workload and other, other factors that can help with your anxiety and mood. Um, and the importance of healthy lifestyle cannot be uh, overemphasized. You want to stay mentally and physically active to help with your depression and your Parkinson's motor symptoms. It's important to have good sleep hygiene, good diet, good exercise for both motor and non-motor symptoms. And exercise and mind-body interventions are really a simultaneous management of motor and non-motor symptoms. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Erin, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about these symptoms and, and behavior, behavioral strategies for dealing with them. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Vega. So right again, to start, um, you know, Dr. Vega really set the stage for understanding depression and anxiety in Parkinson's, you know, including the prevalence and its impact. Um, and he, you know, right, even uh, alluded to some of the interventions, as did, you know, Dr. Mishley and Dr. Simuni's talk in terms of being engaged in with nutrition, exercise research. Um, so we're going to kind of expand upon that and then dig a little uh, deeper. Um, I just want to start by saying that these conversations are can be really nuanced. 
Um, and so I'm merely going to scratch the surface, you know, in, in talking about ways to alleviate the symptoms. Um, so no, again, this is kind of a jumping off point to do your own research, to be curious, to have conversations with, you know, yourself, your family, and, and of course, your doctors as well. All right, so just some starting points. So depression and anxiety, they present in many ways, right? With symptoms manifesting, you know, in physical, mental, and behavioral ways. And they don't always show up the way we think or even the way they're depicted in the media. And this can unintentionally contribute to underreporting. Um, and we just may not recognize the symptoms as connected to a mood disorder, right? Or we might uh, mistakenly attribute them to another condition. So again, this is especially important for folks with Parkinson's, you know, as was previously mentioned, that a lot of the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety mimic some motor presentation. So again, always important to really um, be aware of what's going on. Um, so for that reason, and so many more, it is so important to talk about your experience and ask for help, right? Um, this is a strength to do. We know it's not easy, but talking about it is a strength because, you know, as Dr. Vega mentioned, there are numerous reasons why these symptoms may be showing up, many of which are out of your control. So there is, it's not a weakness. This is a strength to talk about because that is going to be the first step um, in getting help. Um, so again, getting help is in and of itself its own webinar because that's its own skill and takes time um, to practice and implement. It's important to note that there really is no best therapy or approach, right? So there's so many different options when it comes to therapy and what works well for one person might not be the optimal treatment for someone else, right? And so in a similar vein, just because one coping strategy or treatment um, didn't work for you doesn't mean another one won't. Um, so again, a reminder for all of us to really stay flexible when you're experiencing challenges and you know navigating all these care options. Right, so interventions for depression and anxiety, what is available besides medication? Again, we've kind of touched on this through all our presentations, um, but again, good to highlight. So again, numerous things um, are available. And again, medications are often prescribed, but we know that they take, you know, time to go in effect. Um, and while you know, they can, they do work for people. We They might not work for others as well as we'd hope. So, right, what else can we do? A bunch of things. So this slide is by no means an exhaustive list, list of all the options that, you know, of interventions that you can do to uh, relieve um, anxiety and depression, um, but just list some. So you can see, right, like, therapy, um, calling on your sources of strength, strengthening social networks, exercise, movement, daylight exposure, avoiding stimulants, identifying timing and triggers, numerous approaches. You know, some are more, you know, habit incorporating healthy habits, like more simple and straightforward, um, right? Exercise, movement, daylight exposure, avoiding stimulants, which may be especially important um, if you're experiencing anxiety as that caffeine can, can experience that heightened anxiety state, while others may involve a little more of a, you know, kind of reflective approach may involve some more coaching in terms of therapy, mindfulness, identifying those triggers. So again, a bunch of interventions that kind of require us to engage in different ways. So it's about finding what works for you, um, finding what's accessible to you. So really the remainder of the presentation will take a more pointed look at some specific interventions and strategies. So right, therapeutic benefits of exercise. If you right have heard it numerous times in today's talk, if you haven't heard it before umpteen times, I would be shocked. So right, there is uh, many benefits um, in this specific manuscript. It refers to the therapeutic benefits on mood, specifically depression and anxiety, along with cognition and sleep. So, right, research clearly shows um, that exercise can reduce the severity of Parkinson's symptoms and slow down the progression of the signs of the disease. Yet, you know, 
therapeutic benefits of exercise for non-motor symptoms may be you know, less commonly discussed. And so this manuscript, as you see on your screen, kind of reviews the efficacy of aerobic and strengthening um, exercise intervention on Parkinson's compared to more conventional treatments on mood, cognition, and sleep. And really the takeaway is that exercise is important, but also that it is a particularly feasible and accessible treatment for individuals with Parkinson's uh, with minimal side effects and can yield broad spectrum results that improve mood, cognition, and sleep. Um, also worth noting, not necessarily mentioned in this manuscript, is the benefits of other movement, um, right? Tai Chi, yoga, dance. There's a lot of classes uh, that are targeted for people with Parkinson's. Um, again, not only due to the movement of your body, but the mental focus and intention it takes uh, when doing these activities. Uh, so let's talk about therapy, right? Um, you might hear this referred to as talk therapy, psychotherapy, counseling, when we use these terms, generally speaking, we're talking about the same thing. Um, this is talking to someone who is trained to help you deal with difficult thoughts and feelings and behaviors, right? So this is someone who can work with you to understand what may be causing these difficulties and work with you to develop solutions. Um, and again, with Every other treatment, therapy is not one size fits all. So there's actually many different types and approaches to therapy. And essentially therapists use their different approaches and kind of theoretical orientations to kind of guide you um, along with them kind of on this roadmap to how are we going to address you know, what's coming up for you and find workable solutions. Um, so again, I share this to reflect that just because one treatment approach didn't work doesn't mean that you won't respond or kind of jibe with another. Um, why seek therapy, right? There is endless reasons, um, but many individuals seek therapy because they're concerned about their mood. They're concerned about how they're feeling and how it's impacting their daily life. Some people have tried working out things on their own and really require that unbiased professional perspective. Um, you know, friends are great, but friends aren't therapists, unless that is their, their, you know, background, but still you probably should not necessarily use your therapist friend in that way. Um, or again, needing more skills to help cope with the challenges that are presented, uh, you know, in everyday life. And again, numerous benefits to therapy. Um, so, right, they can assist in finding suitable solutions to our difficulties. Um, not to say it will improve all situations, you know, right, as, you know, some situations might not be able to be changed. But again, it can help us empower ourselves to make decisions to best support our overall well-being, right? It can help improve decision-making, improve our mood, mood even um, alleviate pain, reduce stress, and so much more. Um, and when talking about therapy, I think it is vital to um, talk about the importance of goal setting in therapy, right? So having a clear understanding of what are you hoping to get out of therapy, right? What are your goals? What are you wanting the therapist and you to achieve, right? And it, and it really helps to get more specific than, well, I want to feel better. What, how are you going to do that? What is that going to look like? What kind of behaviors and coping skills are you going to engage in to get you there? And so, right, again, focusing on your specific goals can really help to develop deeper insight into what it is you really want in life. And again, I think goals are especially salient for people with Parkinson's um, because um, I know I've heard, you know, folks tell me like, well, talking isn't going to help, right? You know, people might refer to you a therapist or a social worker and your automatic thought might be like, talking isn't going to help. It's not going to take away my disease and that's all I need. And to that, I say you're 100% right. Therapy in and of itself will not take away the reality that you have Parkinson's, but that's not a realistic goal, right? So that's the importance of goal setting, setting realistic goals. So maybe, you know, it's not 
to take away, but it's to, you know, take a step back and be curious. Are there ways to improve my life having Parkinson's? Are there different techniques and coping skills I can develop to help me live with this condition, you know, as, as best as I can? So cognitive behavioral therapy is just one approach or modality um, of therapy. Um, it's it's on probably one of the most practiced, um, accessible, and widely known uh, therapy technique that even is known through, like outside of the professional professional counseling community. I um, mean, again, the reason I'm choosing to highlight this specific technique is that um, it's really the most studied therapeutic intervention used for people with Parkinson's. And it is an active, time-limited, problem-focused therapy, and it um, has us focus intentionally on addressing unhelpful thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors, trying to replace them with more self-helping and realistic ones. So it really calls to mind the connection between our behaviors, our emotions, and our thoughts, and how kind of one affects the other. Um, so again, the research shows um, that it is beneficial in, in reducing uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression, you know, based on research. And we hope that more research being done kind of continually shows this um, and, and kind of produces, you know, specific roadmaps for us to get there. And when we think about, well, why does it, like, why does CBT reduce these symptoms in folks with Parkinson's? Well, it can help individuals obtain problem-solving skills that kind of allow your, you to modify negative thoughts that may be coming up. And again, that maybe inhibit your behaviors and actions. Um, and again, increased coping capacity overall. So to kind of um, uh, show, exemplify, how, you know, one such CBT technique works. We have the CBT triangle. So again, this is just one uh, specific technique used um, within CBT. And again, if CBT doesn't feel like the right fit for you, I think regardless, we can probably draw on tools uh, gained through CBT that can help. Um, so again, the different points of the triangle, the thoughts, the emotions or feelings and behaviors shows that they're all connected, right? One affects the other. Um, again, the premise that our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all connected, that when we our thoughts change the way we feel, which subsequently changes the way we act, and so on and so on, so forth. So if left kind of untreated, you know, the cycle continues. Um, so real quick, let's take an example. So we have Linda. Um, she's a 58-year-old construction worker um, who enjoys tennis. She started to notice some muscle stiffness, had a recent fall, and as such, was seen by a movement disorder neurologist and diagnosed with Parkinson's. After which she understandably is going through a lot. She's overwhelmed, she's numb. Her automatic thought is, why did this happen to me, right? I've always been the picture of health. I've always been active, engaged, why? Um, this leads her to feel angry and depressed. And as a result, that kind of uh, causes her to isolate, avoid not engage in activities that she once enjoyed. So again, how that fits into the CBT diagram shown is my automatic thought is, why did this happen to me? Leading me to feel depressed and angry, leading me to isolate and avoid. Again, um, it's important to note that like, right, we have automatic thoughts for a reason. So it's important to be judgmental, but just bringing awareness to, okay, I have this thought. How is this, uh, you know, uh, making me feel? And then how is this affecting my behavior? Um, so again, right, a lot of our automatic or a lot of our thinking is automatic. Um, so in order to challenge our automatic thoughts, we need to consider new ways to approach the situation. So in this case, Linda, she takes her time to process that diagnosis and what that means for her life, which is important. Um, after which she's able to consider a new thought, right? Living with Parkinson's is challenging, no doubt, but it doesn't mean my life is over. So having that thought allows her to, again, move a little bit away from that depression um, and that anger to kind of feeling more capable. Let me try that kind of emotion on for size. And then feeling that way, you know, kind of, again, takes her a step from isolating and avoiding and allows her to plan an outing with a friend. So, and there's many handouts and exercises with the CBT triangle and, and similar kind of thought-based exercises that 
you know, you can um, write in your own automatic thoughts as well as some challenging statements. So again, it's kind of about rewiring our brain to kind of think differently um, because again, these are automatic. So it takes time and work and effort. So not as heavily um, kind of researched as CBT, but clearly useful in terms of perspectives and tools are two other therapeutic approaches, um, dialectical behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, so right, DBT really um, focuses on striking a balance between acceptance of who you are and your challenges and the benefits of change and ACT or ACT, right, uh, optimizes our psychological flexibility. So again, right, uh, one approach isn't for everyone. So as you can maybe um, tell, DBT and ACT kind of um, help individuals manage emotions and ex psychological experiences in ways that don't necessarily try to change your thinking, um, which CBT kind of more focuses on. Um, so one specific strategy that ACT and DBT um, use is mindfulness, which right is the act of focusing the mind on the present moment without judgment or attachment to that moment. Um, and mindfulness is a buzzword in and of itself is a kind of a, a burgeoning um, subject of research uh, in, in individuals with Parkinson's it may feel too abstract or someone told me to do mindfulness. I don't like medic meditation or yoga. Like it doesn't work for me. I would encourage you um, to explore strategies because there's so many ways that we can incorporate mindfulness. Mindfulness, again, in and of itself is just being in the present moment without judgment or attachment. So I have the five senses exercise as an example, as a fairly accessible way that you can engage in mindfulness really anywhere. You're in the doctor's office. Maybe it was even before you're get, potentially getting your diagnosis or again, really challenging symptoms are presenting themselves and you're feeling really anxious. You're in the waiting room. You know, this is totally accessible. Notice five things that you can see, right? So really rather than getting caught up in the feelings, or the thought patterns that might be coming up, really try to tune in visually. Name just like in mentally five things that you can see, four things that you can feel, three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and then finally noticing one thing that you can taste in that distinct moment. So again, just these little activities help us um, become a little less fused to our thoughts and sometimes our painful emotions that allow for other emotions and experiences to come in. So before we transition to the Q&A, just wanna end with some gentle reminders, right? So not everyone goes through the same process when it comes to dealing with depression and anxiety, and it doesn't always look the same. This is not to say it's better or worse, but just different. Um, so kind of helps us to, again, be non-judgmental and not necessarily engage in comparison, which um, you know can be a wicked foe. It's important to recognize that emotions come and go, right? As much as it feels like emotions may stay with us forever, especially when you're in the thick of depression and anxiety, it's just not true. So appreciating this, who I really wish I didn't feel like this. It's been going on for a while. I know it's not gonna last forever. Kind of helps us to make it to that next moment, frees up space again to allow for other emotions and experiences to come in. And again, it's okay to sit with uncomfortable emotions. And, and can be almost helpful in allowing our self to almost process like that physical feeling of that emotion, right? It allows us to go through the wave so we're not necessarily um, shutting down or uh, opposite, right? Getting over escalated where we're out of kind of that window of distress tolerance. It's unpleasant and I know I can get through this. And there's numerous ways, right? Endless ways um, to process your emotion, emotion, right? Journaling, writing, painting, exercise, talking to someone, so many like, endless ways. So it's really about finding what works for you um, and being curious about your thoughts and feelings, right? Like I said, we have automatic thoughts, some of which, you know, we might label as unhelpful or negative, um, but let's be non-judgmental. Okay, I'm having this thought, right? I wish I wouldn't versus I shouldn't. You don't want to, you know, should on yourself. Um, I wish I wasn't experiencing this, but like, where is that emotion coming from? 
How am I feeling in my body? What is this emotion trying to tell me? So being really curious about what's going on and discovering what acceptance means to you. I think acceptance um, can be, you know, again, uh, a tough word to swallow when we talk about having Parkinson's. Well, no, I don't accept that I have it. Acceptance doesn't have to mean that you like it, that you agree with it, or you understand it, right? Maybe one reframe is that it's allowing you a sense of peace or freedom to experience um, and respond in a way that feels authentic to you. So you're able to tolerate a wide spectrum of emotions. Like I accept what is happening to me. I don't like it. And finally, practicing self-compassion, right? This is tough stuff to go through. Um, so when engaging in life and especially when engaging in these different interventions that can require a lot of mental, physical, emotional energy, it can be really um, helpful to practice self-compassion, which right teaches us to Um, support ourselves and encourage ourselves rather than being judgmental about what's happening. So again, such an important topic that I only scratched the surface on, but I hope this provides a jumping off point with which, you know, you can explore, have conversations and, you know, utilize different techniques. Again, with that, we're going to transition into the Q&A panel. Huge shout out to Parkinson's Foundation, Kiowa Kieran, Abby, Supernus, and Zenobian. So again, with our Q&A panel, you'll see all of the people that you've heard from, including myself on your screen, Dr. Tanya Samuni, Dr. Danny Bega, and Dr. Lori Mishley. Um, We've had over 50 questions come in. Unfortunately, we are running a little behind, but we will do our best to address as many. Um, you know, in the past, we've been able to send out a Q&A document because your questions are so, so important and many are nuanced in ways that we just can't adequately address. Um, but we're gonna ask as many as possible. I'm gonna start out with Dr. Mishley as you know, you were the first presentation and arguably we had so many questions, the most questions come in for you, which was great because it's such an important topic. Um, so Dr. Mishley, to start, um, a lot of questions about probiotics, you know, would you recommend a certain probiotic um, and kind of a, um, so that would be first question about kind of general thoughts about probiotics and recommendations um, and do any probiotics specifically help with constipation as we know that is a super common um, non-motor symptom that folks with Parkinson's experience. Yeah, yeah. So I'll try to make this short and I'll say that I do think that there are a couple studies and patient experience that probiotics can help with constipation in the short term. I am not convinced that probiotics are poised to slow Parkinson's disease progression, and I don't generally recommend them in clinic. Um, There's no question that the Parkinson's disease gut is messed up and that there are the, the organisms that are growing in the Parkinson's gut are different than what we see in a healthy cohort. The problem that we have is as we get better and better at describing the organisms that are living in our gut, when we start doing the higher quality analysis, we see that we each have five to seven million different species, and we don't know much about most of them. And so for any one company or researcher to come by and say, hey, I think that combining these four or five or these six or seven are going to be a meaningful game changer, I'm not convinced. I think if we really want to change the microbiome, the best way to do that is by changing our diet and what we feed the organisms that are growing in our gut, Um, save maybe things like fecal transplants that might be coming down the road. Uh, Another question directed towards you, Dr. Mishley, is your thoughts um, on supplements, uh, supplements rather, and vitamins um, aimed at Um, improving brain health for folks with Parkinson's specifically, right? I know I see ads for Prevagen all the time. So curious if you have thoughts on that. Um, I don't know so much about Prevagen. I mean, I was really surprised on this recent analysis that we did that Ginkgo came up in first place on our list of supplements. There are a couple thousand years of use of Ginkgo for a brain enhancing drug. I'm not sure if the double blind studies support that or not, but that has certainly been shown to increase blood flow to the head. Um, And it has antioxidant properties and iron chelating properties. And there might be some reasons that ginkgo actually does look good. Um, There is some really interesting research on turmeric and curcumin 
uh, outside of Parkinson's disease as a cognitive enhancing agent. Uh, some people have mentioned choline and CDP choline. I think uh, there are a bunch of animal models that suggest CDP choline as a supplement improves learning and memory. And so I think there's a lot of um, potential to maybe do some research in CDP choline for cognitive enhancement in Parkinson's disease. But um, and, and the most important of all, I mean, I am a big advocate of patients taking as much levodopa and dopamine replacement strategy as they need. And we have known for decades that the more levodopa you're on and the longer you're on it, the more it raises your homocysteine levels. And homocysteine elevations are a major, well-established risk factor for cognitive decline. And so I insist that all of my patients who are on levodopa get a homocysteine level tested once a year. And if their homocysteine levels go up above 10, I put them on a B vitamin supplement to lower their homocysteine levels and as a strategy for preventing cognitive decline. And fish oil. Thank you. Um, Dr. Simone, um, right, your presentation, as always, does a great job at kind of overview of therapeutic pipeline, options for research, what's going on, what's to come. Um, you know, a lot inherently of the research being done is often focused on like early stage. And so you right, sometimes that um, makes people at later stages kind of feel left out of kind of that research sector. So I'm curious if you can speak to kind of what's going on or what's available in terms of research and trials for individuals who are not newly diagnosed or even at advanced stages of the disease. Absolutely. So again, I hope that my talk didn't give that perspective that once you are beyond the first couple of years of uh, the disease, your research opportunities uh, progressively go down. I just focused on disease modification. <clears throat> and that's majority of these studies still are being done in the early phase of the disease. But uh, to address your question directly, there is a number of therapeutics that are being tested in the more advanced stages of the disease, largely focused on management of the symptoms. And I very quickly ran through them, be that uneven response to the medications, be that medication-induced involuntary movements, dyskinesia. So that is to increase the armamentarium of what we have now. And I think that I expressed myself that the bar is set very high. Levodopa is exceptionally good drug. So for the new class of drugs to really not to be approved, they will be approved, but to be, be clinically meaningful to the patients, the bar is very high, right? However, we have tremendous need for developing drugs for the non-motor symptoms of the disease. Lori talked about it. Uh, Dr. Vega talked about that. Erin, uh, you covered it very elegantly, right? We have tremendous need. And those studies, and again, I very quickly ran through them, but those studies are finally being done because those are tough studies to do, right? For multiple reasons. But industry is in interested to develop therapies for cognitive manifestations of the disease. And I would make an argument that if we develop a therapeutic to either slow progression of cognitive dysfunction or delay the onset of cognitive dysfunction for people who are on trajectory to develop that, that would be the major disease modifying therapy. And we finally, so that's my perspective, we'll stop. No, that's wonderful. So again, right, just, want to underscore that there's research trials, engagement opportunities, regardless of what stage you are. Um, and Dr. Vega, right, our, all of our talks touched on the importance of exercise, um, which cannot be underscored. Um, so a lot of questions about what's the best exercise, uh, you know, optimal exercise for someone with Parkinson's. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, talk about that. I, so the good news is that any exercise is probably beneficial. Um, and there was actually a nice uh, overview study of meta-analysis that looked at all the different studies on, on different kinds of exercise that have been published in Parkinson's. And the bottom line conclusion from it was that all of all exercise is beneficial in people with Parkinson's. So that's the good news. Um, some, some things to think about is 
we, with medications, we give you a specific dosage, a pres prescription, how much you should take and how often. And we're worse about that, that with exercise, even though it's, we know it's important, we don't give you often a specific enough prescription. And there are scientists, physiologists, researchers, some here at Northwestern, uh, in particular, Daniel Corcos, as an example, who are doing research specifically to try and come up with that dosage. You know, what's the level of intensity and frequency that is the most beneficial? And there's some suggestions, for instance, that moderate levels of, it, of it intensity, getting your heart rate up to uh, a, a level where you're a little bit short of breath, a little bit sweaty, that that is more effective than lower intensity exercise. And there's questions now about whether high intensity might even be better than moderate intensity. And so a lot is still being done to try and answer that. So we don't know exactly, but what you can say for sure is that being sedentary is, is, is not in your best interest. Movement is important. Um, and you need to tailor it to your abilities, to your levels. And so if you are um, not an independent walker, if you do need to assistance to walk or need to be in a wheelchair, you can still be very active. There's still a lot you can do, which is chair-based exercise. You can uh, do stretching and resistance exercise. Um, and if you're more independent, you, you can push yourself to, to exercise at a higher level. There should be some aerobic component. There should be some strength component. There should be some balance component, uh, working on, on uh, uh, reducing risk of falls over time. And ideally, there should be some enjoyment, right? It should be something you'll stick with um, and something that gives you other benefits too, improves your mood and uh, teaches you something new to improve your thinking. And so if you can incorporate those things, I don't think you should focus on one specific type of exercise. Yeah, absolutely. And just a, a shout out also to Parkinson's Foundation, who if you go to parkinson.org backslash, backslash exercise, um, they actually have a kind of um, handout diagram where you can even uh, see kind of some, again, recommendations. Um, but again, important to cater um, to your abilities and, and safety levels. Um, you know, Dr. Mishley, uh, can you speak... I think this is kind of hearkening back on the graph that you had up when you had like the excellent, good, fair, poor. Um, just curious if you can expand upon like what you, like, uh, you referred to as like the good years. We had some questions come in asking for clarification about how this is impacted by age of diagnosis and how long you've had the diagnosis for. So, right, if I was diagnosed 20 years ago. Does that mean I only have two more good years left. Yeah, so I just curious if you could expand upon that. Yeah, there is another version of that of that picture that has these little green dots that represent all the real people in the study. And when I show that version of the graph, it, it probably sinks in a little bit better that there is a ridiculous amount of diversity. There are people who are doing excellent 25 years after diagnosis. And there are people who are doing really poorly two or three years after diagnosis. And so that line you see through the center is just a statistical average. It is not what your story is going to be. And in fact, that's the whole point is we're studying the subset of people who have your diagnosis, but are thriving 10 and 20 years post-diagnosis. So when I say 10 good years, I, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about what we're seeing in the cohort. And, and so there's, that's the first point. Um, and then what we did is uh, if you go to the ProPD, there are 33 symptoms, ProPD.org. There are 33 individual symptoms. And we just people, ask people to slide a slider bar. How bad has it been this past week? And the more severe it's been the past week, the greater you give your score. And then we also asked, how is your quality of life, your social health, your emotional health, your physical health, your pain, your social, and, and people who scored less than 500 on the pro PD tended to be excellent in their quality of life. 500 to 1,000, their quality of life was good. And so what we did is we just overlaid those two graphs. I'm sure there are people who have a 1,500 and an excellent quality of life. I'm sure there are people who have a 200 and a horrible quality of life. Don't get too hung up on that. What I'm trying to convey is it looks like the lower we can get your pro PD score, hopefully the higher your quality of life. And the name of the game is how long can we keep your score as low as possible? And we gave you a lot of intervention and ways to keep that score low. Right. Um, Dr. Samuni, um, someone uh, was interested in kind of the research about focused ultrasound. 
um, in terms of how its like efficacy is compared to DBS or deep brain stimulation. So I guess also for those on the call, if you could just, Dr. Samuni, briefly um, kind of reintroduce us to what DBS and focused ultrasound are um, and kind of speak to um, why someone might get it and kind of the efficacy compared to one another. Oh, one moment, doc, uh, Dr. Samuni, we'll just have to unmute you. Okay, sorry, I was muted. So uh, first of all, focused ultrasound and deep brain stimulation, for short DBS, both belong to the category of advanced therapeutic options. Both are offered to people who uh, don't have sufficient benefit from the established uh, medical management of the disease. Focused ultrasound specifically as of today is indicated for people whose trauma does not respond well to the medications. While deep brain stimulation is indicated also for that category of people, but majority of uh, our patients who get deep brain stimulation, they get it for uneven response to the medications. Fluctuations, dyskinesia is the primary indication. Medication, what we call refractory trauma is the other indication. There are no head-to-head, side-by-side comparison of those interventions. There is indirect data. Uh, tremor response seems to be comparably good with both indications. But again, going back to the nature of the procedure, focused ultrasound is using focused ultrasound, high-intensity ultrasound, to map it and to plan it to achieve particular area of the brain that participates in generation of tremor. So it's really creating a small lesion, right? It, the benefit persists for at least the first couple of years. In the data that we have now, seems like it starts subsiding after that. The brain stimulation is putting the electrode potentially in the same area of the brain, but it's connected to the battery. So we can dial it up, we can adjust it, we can reduce the stimulation. So it's much more maneuverable, right? So again, the person who is considered for advanced therapeutics will meet with the neurologist who has expertise in both. And depending on their particular symptoms, also their age, their preferences, one is more invasive than the other, will decide what therapeutic intervention is best for that particular person. Thank you. Um, Dr. Baker, this question comes up a lot and, and did so today, um, which I think you alluded to, but again, I think um, is it so important that it, it begs repeating there's so many different symptoms, right? We talked about how they kind of mimic each other with even between mood and, uh, or like Parkinson's motor and some of the mood symptoms. So how does, you know, someone distinguish if it's Parkinson's mental health disorder or something else? So it really does need to be brought up with the neurologist at the visits. Um, and it's really ideal to have a, a companion or someone who can, who's observed things be there with you for visits occasionally. Um, because, you know, we want to hear what your experience as, as the person living with it is, but we also want to hear what others are observing um, and, and why uh, uh, someone might be saying that their loved one is depressed or anxious. Um, sometimes we get different stories from the person living with it and from their family members. So it's important for us to put that all together. Um, you know, and, and then it's, uh, at that point, we have to really assess the different symptoms that, that you're experiencing and determine whether they, they seem in our experience more like symptoms that are associated with Parkinson's or not. Um, and their relationship to medications is really helpful. And so sometimes we'll have you fill out a diary um, where we have you keep track of, you know, when you take your Parkinson's medications um, and then when you experience certain symptoms and we can see if there's patterns to it that could explain it. Um, sometimes it's pretty clear from the way it's being described that it is depression or anxiety and needs to be treated. Sometimes we'll, we'll need to refer you to a psychiatrist to kind of help us get a, a, a sense of that. Um, other times we might order some blood work to look for medical explanations, thyroid abnormalities, vitamin deficiencies, things like that. Um, and so it uh, really needs sort of a, a comprehensive evaluation specifically targeted at that. Thank you. 
Um, so Dr. Mishley, right, a lot of questions came in about what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat, right? Like what would aggravate PD symptoms or what, you know, is best to improve gut health? Like, do you have um, recommendations about food or a diet that is associated with, you know, less Parkinson's symptoms? Yeah, I, I mean, it's not the, the data that is coming out of our MVP study is not that different than the Mediterranean diet or the mind diet. I mean, we're talking about high fruit, fresh is best. Fresh fruits and fresh vegetables are clearly better than even frozen. So fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, nuts and seeds, non-fried fish, olive oil, coconut oil, water, green tea, wine, brown rice, quinoa, buckwheat, some of these ancient grains, oatmeal, fresh herbs and spices. If that is making up most of your diet, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. And you have to start at breakfast. You can't have a muffin with no real nutritional value for breakfast and, you know, a grilled cheese for lunch and think you're going to get your nutritional fruits and vegetables at dinner. So I would encourage people to start earlier in the day and really try and get some of the good healthy food in early um, and what to eat to stop progression again is what different than what's going to make your symptoms better right? Optimizing meds really comes down to a protein redistribution diet, how to save most of your dietary protein for dinner. So if people, if the goal is optimizing your response to levodopa, what I will often encourage people to do is a lower protein breakfast, a lower protein lunch, and making sure that you get your day's protein requirements in the latter part of the day. Thank you. Um, a common question um, we get is kind of what stage of diagnosis, and this and this honestly um, could be addressed by any of you. You know, what stage am I at? And I, I think this right. This is an important question sometimes for people, and has implications for you know maybe um, whether they are accepted or you know granted disability or not, or even just explaining and conceptualizing what they're going through to others. Again, other reasons too. Um, but how does someone know kind of what stage they're at? Uh, you know, in the diagnosis. Dr. Samuni, do you want to take that one? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was waiting who of us would do that. Right. So, um, easy question and very complicated question. Easy question because there is, since availability of levodopa, um, 60s, there is what is called Han and Yar five staging system of Parkinson's disease which is very high level. One, zero, no symptoms. One, symptoms on one side of the body. Two, symptoms on both sides of the body. Three is having balance problems. Four, more disability. And five, advanced stage of the disease. So people very frequently so much zoom into it. The way we always explain is that that system is helpful for us. It most is helpful transition from two to three when someone develops balance problems and becomes at higher risk of falls. That is a significant milestone in the disease because safety measures have to be introduced and so on. But think about it. When the stage is having symptoms on both sides of the body, it can be just minimal disability of finger tapping. It's two. And it's someone having major problems with the speed of their movements. And if their balance is fine, it's still stage two, right? So that's why it's on the one hand straightforward, on the other hand is challenging. We need to transition into much more biological staging of the disease to connect the symptoms with what's happening in the brain. It's again, obvious to say, much more complicated to do, but there is a lot of work going on that actually is getting us closer to accomplishing that. Because for multiple reasons, that will allow us to personalize therapeutics. I talked a little bit about that in my talk to the biology of individual person that will advance how we develop therapeutics, linking biology to the symptoms. It will make much more meaningful conversation. 
So I will stop. I'll just add one quick little thing here. Um, is my, the other thing is when someone asks me that question, what stage am I? My next question is, why do you care? Why are you asking? Because it's really important to understand um, if someone is asking, am I stage two or am I stage three? Because they interpret that stage to mean my disease is bad. That's not the message that you should get. Um, because you could be very depressed and be stage one and have a very poor quality of life. And you could be a stage two and be exercising and working and functioning fine. And it, it, as, as Dr. Simoni alluded to, it doesn't speak to the biology of how bad the disease is in your brain necessarily. And, and there's such a variety of, of function and quality of life that you can be within any given stage. And so just important to, to kind of keep that when you're thinking about your staging and reading about it on the internet, not to focus too much on the number. Uh, yeah, I, I'd also like to add one thing that you saw that curve where the disease gets worse over time. We looked at, I think it was 1,200 people in the United States and Canada who had six data points over seven years. And seven percent of people in the United States and Canada are actually getting are better today than they were six years ago, with pharmaceuticals, with exercise, with diet, with friends, with all of these things. Their trend line is not going up; it's been stable or getting better. And so, it's neat to start to turn our attention to those seven percent of people who have figured out their own code for what makes it better year after year, not worse. So, it's not always a each year is worse than the year before. Thank you all. Um, and I am gonna field the last question that we received as I think it's hopeful or good to end on a hopeful note. So someone asked, how do I stay hopeful, right? And I think that's so salient because Again, we talked about, um, you know, just the prevalence and impact that, you know, having a mood disorder um, that it comes along with Parkinson's and how it can affect your quality of life. Um, so I'm going to borrow a concept from Brene Brown, who is a clinical social worker and pretty world-renowned lecturer and professor and author and podcast host. So um, shout out to Brene, um, look her up. Um, but she kind of describes hope as a more cognitive process versus an emotion, right? It is a learned behavior that kind of has this trifecta of setting realistic goals, um, realizing pathways to meet those goals, and having agency, right? The belief that we can have those goals. Um, and, and again, right, hope doesn't come when we're, you know, just experiencing like the good parts of life. It is born out of adversity, right? So you just got a Parkinson's diagnosis or you are dealing with a very challenging symptom of Parkinson's, right? So it's, it's natural, I think, for those kind of um, feelings of maybe even hopelessness and despair, right? Kind of the antithesis of what you might uh, think of as hope to come up. Um, but, and again, right, hope may not be sufficient in all circumstances, right? Hope is helpful when we feel like we have agency and have pathways. So, right, no, we can't change the fact that you don't, you, you have Parkinson's, at least not yet. Um, but again, maybe not the goal. So how can we reframe our goals and learn pathways to meet those goals, which right, all of our all of our presentations today address those different pathways. Um, and as Dr. Vega mentioned in, in kind of the talk, right, there is hope. All of these presentations alluded to the fact that there is amazing work and progress being done. So like there's hope right there. But again, it's really, um, again, tuning to what's realistic for you right now, finding pathways on your own with others, and then again, really just believing that you can do this. Um, and again, right, we talked about it's being reflective, it's being curious, it's engaging others, it's talking, it's asking for help. Um, so again, really uh, great, great kind of note to end on that there is hope. And when you maybe can't find it is the perfect um, time to reach out to, to find hope um, through others or to have others hold that hope for you. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us today. I know we ran a little bit over, but I think it was worth it to kind of get everything that addressed that we did. You know, we really, um, as a center of excellence, pride ourselves on offering as much comprehensive care, which again, not only is the clinical research piece, but it's webinars like these, it's our support groups, it's our one-on-one -on -one connections. Um, and so also to note that all of the programs and classes um, offered through 
Northwestern is not exclusive to being a Northwestern patient. So we really love to expand our impact, not only you know in Chicago, but the Midwest across the nation. So please know that all of those you know, resources and classes, um, again, a lot of offered on the virtual platform right now are um, accessible to all, which will again be sent out in terms of our wrap up email. Again, recording, slide decks, resources will be sent in the upcoming weeks. Again, thank you again so much to uh, Dr. Simuni, Dr. Bega, Dr. Mishley for sharing your time and expertise. Huge shout out to Parkinson Foundation, right, our co-sponsor, as well as Abby, Supernus, Kiowa Kieran, and Synovian. You know, right, we don't we can't have these programs without sponsorship. So huge shout out to them and all the work they're doing in this field. And again, um, or, uh, join us next Sunday, October 16th at Soldier Field in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Bega and I will be there along with some other staff. So can't wait to, again, right, come together in this PD community. A reminder, evaluation will pop up. Um, so please fill that out. Let us know what we did. Let us know what we're looking for in future programs. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. And, and thank you to Erin for all of your hard work. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you so much, all. Thank you, everyone. Great job. Thank you.